<laughs> All right, let's open up in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to sit around your word with like-minded people discussing your truth. And most of all, Father, allowing you to speak into our lives within our time frame, with the framework of your Torah. I thank you for your insights that you're going to share today. And Father, let there be more insights and reveal to us what you want us to know. I ask it all in the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so last week we did not have a Torah portion, but I just dragged it along. Um, so we have basically two Torah portions. And for my lovely wife's sake, I've got 25 slides. Not too bad. <laughs> I deleted a few, otherwise we're not going to get through it. Um, so the first Torah portion is Vayera, and the second one is Bo. Um, so basically, I appeared and then go. Mm -hmm. is the underlining mm -hmm. um, theme. So there's just a rundown of the topics. So it's all about the plagues. First Torah portion deal with plague one to seven, second one, last three plagues. Mm -hmm. Also elaborate a bit more on the Passover. So we're going to spend a lot of time on one plague, which is plague number seven. Mm -hmm. We're going to just scheme through the others. Now we don't have much time to go into each of them. We're just going to note them what they're there for but plague number seven is going to take a lot of air time and for a specific reason the way it's structured within the text it actually stands out as the most important one and of course because we're very sensitive for things happening around us it's yet again an end time point of view mm -hmm. uh, with the framework of the plagues um, I also link it to the book of Revelation for those plagues. So we'll see the plagues in parallel um, and the patterns that mm -hmm. align there as well. And then we're going to do a bit on Passover, specifically on the concept of the threshold covenant, because that's something that people don't really know about. Mm -hmm. I heard this when we visited, we were still living in Wahala, I think. We visited friends in Gimpi and they had a fellowship down south towards Brisbane. And they facilitated the Passover and they brought up the topic of the Threshold Covenant, but just a brief discussion, nothing deep, but it actually sparked something um, of value. And there's actually a lot of value in that. So we're gonna look at that. I did do that in a previous Passover as a main topic. So I just pulled out those information um, from there. But it actually lays the foundation for us going into a Passover. Yeah, and I think um, if all agree that we might make it this year's... Um, yeah, we can... Well, we can ask Yahweh what he wants to do and share, but I think it will be a good teaching on Passover. It's really mm -hmm. good to realise what the special yeah, covenant is all about. Yeah. It's all about the painting of the blood. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into it. So just to get our storyline flowing, we started off in Shemot, which is names, storyline, backdrop, Egypt, Israel, entrapped in slavery. Mitzrayim comes from with Matzor, that means um, fortress, siege stronghold um, and then when you look at the root word of that tor it means to shut in to enclose uh, to confine and to treat as an adversary so that's what israel faced they were enslaved they were treated like the adversary and it was a stronghold that was placed upon them and now we read about how do they escape that so we know they went into egypt because of a famine so they were basically forced into that system. In the same way, if you look at the parallel where we're at, we're not in an Egypt system, we're in a Babylon system, but they're basically this, of the same kind. The one is more based on false gods and sin and bondage and all those things, which is basically in the world. But Babylon is more of a sophisticated system that's got a lot of um, religious lingo in it. 
because the Babylon system entrenched itself with an existing system. It's not something like Egypt that exists on its own. Mm -hmm. It's a method that's applied to something like a political system, like a religious system. And that's where its power lies. Mm -hmm. um, but it's got the same attributes of Egypt, but it's more the system that it's embedded within. And Babylon even exists within the body of Messiah. <coughs> that's how powerful it is to infiltrate everything. It's like a cancer mm -hmm. that just grows. And the people that allow it will give it, will give it power. So, <coughs> all right. So the other thing about Egypt is that because it initially was all about salvation and it was my place of refuge, you draw attached to that. And then you don't want to let go of that thing because I was saved by that. Now, if you just look at the, the whole work of Messiah, some people accept Messiah, but they get stuck in Egypt. They don't want to leave the world. Some sort of leave, they go to baptism, then they get to the mountain. Oh, it's too hard. They step back and then they worship around the golden calf with all their little symbols that they bring in from the world. Others have the guts to face the mountain. They accepted the Ten Commandments, but they can't move further because there's actually more commandments that was given after the Ten Commandments. And they're normally dancing around Mount Sinai worshiping the Ten Commandments. They never go into the wilderness. When you go into the wilderness, that's where you experience the tabernacle, the household. And that's basically the the whole idea of Israel. Mm -hmm. We looked at the, the creation of Israel through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob became Israel, had 12 sons, and that was the foundation of this household. And we're basically part of the same household, and it was symbolized by the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And the tabernacle is your, uh, your refuge of safety mm -hmm. while you travel your, during the wilderness. In saying that, a tabernacle is also what we have here. If you on your own little little spark out there all by yourself mm -hmm. there's no safety in that because you're in the wilderness mm -hmm. you could quickly be quenched and die um, there's safety in numbers mm -hmm. that's why it's always good to fellowship with people and that's why um, Paul in Ephesians also talk about peace mm -hmm. trying to get people together and we had the practical example of new people coming in how do we reach out to them not to leave them behind staying at this level and they can't understand we need to start of slowing down meet them on their level and slowly get them on the journey so it's all about those tactics that we need to learn to get people on board in, inside the tabernacle while we travel towards the jordan and we all know what jordan means that's the uh, times of sorrows the great tribulation and beyond that is the kingdom so we are still this side of the jordan and there's a lot of people that will want to come in and we need the experience to do that. And I think we're slowly learning as a, as a group and hope other groups learn the same. Not to push Christians away. Don't push Jews away. Don't push unbelievers away. Just try and meet them where they're at and slowly get them on a journey. Mm -hmm. so it's just quite unique an analogy of is if you're isolated, it's like an animal. If an animal, the enemy can isolate an animal, see the good target. Yeah, mm. easy prey, but if you're not isolated, mm. difficult mm. safety in numbers. Basically, yeah. you see that every day. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and the first place Israel went to when once they left Egypt was Sukkot, mm. and we've got the pattern of Sukkot, the feast of Sukkot. What's it about? We come together, mm. it's all about the same link for a period of time, mm. not to lose that. Okay, quick recap on Horeb. The summit at, of Mount Sinai, which is connected to Choref, that means um, to dry up in desert. It's also the meaning of Cheref, that means sword. That's attached to the symbolism of the burning mountain, the burning sword, the burning bush. Um, all become one. Um, and we're going to look in this study about the main theme of God appearing. And what's the symbols of that? Um, and I'm not going to give it away now. I still have to wait a couple of slides. Mm -hmm. All right. So what actually brought this to being that we have two Torah portions actually added another layer of revelation. Mm -hmm. Because if you combine the two headings, I appear and go, it actually gives you the idea of when to go 
when you see the signs of him appearing. Now, what's interesting here is that the word plague is only found once in the Torah and only in the context of the seventh plague. The other plagues were referred to as signs and wonders and judgments. So the word plague is only connected to the seventh plague. So we can see that the appearance of Yahweh from signs and wonders one to six was sort of an introductory and the actual plague was the seventh one, which was the most, most severe one. Um, and that lines up with what's in Matthew 24. It talks about, you will see these signs of the end times. It's all about those little things you have to see because he's slowly appearing. And when you see those things, you need to go. And that's where Revelation 18 warn, warns us to come out of her, my people, mm -hmm. recognizing the system of Babylon that infiltrated everything. So we need to raise our awareness on that and slowly get out of those things. Just before you move on, um, my understanding of bow in modern Hebrew is it means come. It's the same thing. It means come and go. It's both. <laughs> well, that's a bit... How can it be both? It's like I godesh, see. that means male temple prostitute and holiness. It's, oh. it's two opposing meanings, wow. oh. but... The one is not contradicting the other. It's the context that gives it its value. Yeah, because yeah. Or the point of Anyone view. Who hears it. So no, from Yahweh's point of view, it, to him it's come. Yeah. From our point of view, it it's means go. go. Yeah, yeah. Say, so it's the same thing from a different point of view. Yeah. 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 So if that's we, the power of Hebrew. If we go, we come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. But that's just how the Hebrew works. Mm -hmm. So one thing I just want to quickly underline here that uh, a lot of people don't understand is I had a question about interpreting the Torah when I was in Adelaide there was a lot of different opinions basically the other congregation had a different point of view what I had there was always a bit of a conflict and a you know, issue around that and then I prayed about it and I felt in my heart that they always said it's not really about the meaning it's about the process of you engaging with my word because I'm changing the way you think. Mm. That's the main function of the Torah. Mm. It's not about information. It's about mm. changing the way you think. Mm. Because if I change my way of thinking, mm. I can take real life experience or situations, apply the same way of thinking. It's mm. as if the Torah commandment will unfold in front of me in relation to that thing God. without being written down. Yeah. Mm. So the interaction yeah. with the Torah is the most important thing. It's not about I'm right, you're wrong and all that. Mm. And these little things that we learn mm. from the language, mm. that's wisdom. Mm. And you can apply that in mm. your normal life as well. Mm. So we it's actually learn the wisdom. Writing it, the Torah on our hearts yeah. means that, that whatever interaction we have with the world around us is from that foundation. We may not even be aware of it, like yeah. I say. Yeah. It's... And if you think about it from Yahweh's perspective, before he wrote the Torah, mm -hmm. it was yeah, in his mind and he acted on it. Mm -hmm. It even said that Abraham obeyed the Torah, but there was no written Torah. Mm -hmm. So his mind was already changed to think in the mm -hmm. same way as the father. And he applied his life towards the intention of what the commandment mm -hmm. was supposed mm -hmm. to do. And that's the highest level of understanding yeah. Torah or engaging with Torah. So if people say Torah's done away with you're losing so much opportunity mm. to change your mind. Mm. And whether we get the term the mind of Christ, the mind of Messiah, mm. is not just something that will pop up supernaturally, mm. download oh, I've not got the mind of Christ. It's, scripture. it's not knowledge. It's, scripture and verse. That's not it's the way you, you think. Mm. Yeah. Philip, that's yeah. why when you read Abraham never walked with the Lord, he walked before the Lord. Mm. Yeah. So he had those things inside of him that he could he had that ability to walk before the Lord. And not only that, walking before the Lord means that he's the sheep and mm. the father is the shepherd. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the shepherd mm -hmm. basically look after his flock. Mm -hmm. like the sheep and the yeah. shepherd. Yeah. yeah. So you, you get all those little symbolism and things. Mm -hmm. And now you, you've got a practical situation. I've got people I need to manage at work. What do I do? 
Mm. You apply the same wisdom. Mm -hmm. So there's a Torah that's written in your mind, mm -hmm. the technique, how to deal with this, yeah. that you apply mm -hmm. without being written down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so Vayera, I appeared. That's where you always said, I am. And he has said that to um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he revealed himself as El Shaddai, which is his name. So we see the context of Shem, which is Shemot, the, the theme of this book, in relation to his name El Shaddai. Bo is in Genesis 2.19. Um, oh, sorry, is, 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 is first used that word Bo, um, that's found in the second Torah portion is in Genesis 2.19, where Yahweh formed every creature out of the ground and brought them to Adam so that he could name them. So the context of bringing them to and naming them has to do with the identity. So we get the context of revealing Yahweh in his context as El Shaddai, but the context of a name is also your character. But when the name he gave Moses was not El Shaddai, it was Yotevave, which is a different name. So that means that something is changing or the one whose name is El Shaddai is going to respond or act differently towards us because his name is changing. Mm -hmm. um, his destiny or his application mm -hmm. is changing. That it's going to interact. So revealing a name is more about how it's going to react to you in, in, this, in this context. And... Um, all right, so part of the naming is also to do with calling someone. Call is the word kara, that means to appoint, to call out, and to proclaim. Now, to call out, we can call out the name, which is linked to salvation. Um, we can also call people out of the system. That means that they need to move out. But for those who are in the body of Messiah, it's more about to proclaim because you are appointed to fulfill a certain function for those who need to be called out and so that they can call out to his name. So we need to understand our function in, in this whole context where we sit. So salvation is not a cheap ride where you get a ticket and off you go. You don't even see who's sitting next to you. You don't care about the people standing outside. That's the wrong idea of salvation. Salvation is not selfish. It's always about the collective. Now what I shared last night um, which um, has to do I probably need to open it up no I'm not going to open it up I described the six levels of what makes man man but this is the man according to what Yahweh's blueprint is um, in the Garden of Eden context so the first one is the body um, which is Basar then you get Nasham, uh, Nefesh which is this physical soul or the personality, or the mind, or intelligence. Then you get the neshama, which is the awakening of the spiritual side of your soul that connects to the ruach. So we have the body, we have the nefesh, we have the neshama, and then you get his ruach. So we are currently on stage four, or this level four level of restoration of what man can be. But there's two more to come. Now the two that's to come cannot happen in the physical. But because they have to do with the kingdom beyond, the kingdom above time, which is Chaya. And Chaya has to do with Chai, Chai Olam, eternal life. And that's a kingdom principle from where the king um, exists. So that's a physical place that's outside of this realm that elevates you to a place of eternal life. So it's not the body as such that's got eternal life. It's the place that you are that allow you to have eternal life. Um, and then the last one is Yechida that has to do with the collective body. So it's not about a singular body. It's about like uh, the, the example of Adam that was separated into Adam and Chava. And through the marriage covenant, they become one flesh. In the same way, Yahweh created Adam and he separated them and multiplied them just like he multiplied Abraham into the 12 sons and then to the nations. At the end, the covenant will unify everything back together unto him. But we need to be unified into one Adam again, into one body. That's why you refer to us singular as the bride. And that bride, through the marriage covenant, become one with him again. And then we become one entity again. So it's all about the reuniting of the separated pieces that were multiplied. So you can separate the little bits that's not supposed to be there. 
It's like cutting someone open, removing the cancers, and then stitching them up together, making them one again. It's a healing process. It's a restoration process that takes place. But ultimately, we share the same spirit that he has, which is the Ruach component. That makes you part of his household, part of his family, part of his DNA. So you can be in his image and his likeness. And that's the fourth part. So if you are born again, you accept Messiah as your savior, mm -hmm. and you received, uh, you received the, the gift and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you have the Ruach, but also the gifts. And that's where this um, next thing come in to uh, be appointed or anointed so you can proclaim his name and also get people into that tabernacle, so to speak, um, to be part of that called out once. Mm -hmm. All right, a little bit long there on this one. We're not going to make it. We're going to definitely <laughs> pass two hours now. <laughs> All right, so liberations through signs and wonders. Now, if you just think about the first coming of Messiah, what did he do? He did signs and wonders. And looking at this pattern, we can say he appeared. Yahweh appeared through signs and wonders mm. through the man who had no sin called Yeshua. Mm. So that was a form of appearing. We also have the same appearing now because we experience some signs and wonders amongst us collectively as a body because we represent him. But there's a time that there will be a bit more coming and up to the point of judgment or uh, death that he carried the judgment. So we're going to follow the exact same pattern. Um, experience the plague. Yeshua's plague was death um, that he bore on our behalf, but that was the Red Sea. Or the baptism death now the jordan death is the next one which we will experience collectively as well um, and it's preceded by signs and wonders or signs of the times uh, already mentioned about the seventh plague which is exodus 13 uh, 9 verse 13 to 35 and this one was a bit of a stronger word in relation to the judgments um, and we're going to look at the exact phrase where that was used and why I say that, but that I'll leave a little bit later. Which was that Seventh one, the hail and fire. Yeah, which is very significant, which is the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to understand is when you research Egyptian uh, mythology, you'll see that the 10 plagues were actually judgments upon the gods of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So the same judgment that will be on Babylon will be because of the gods of Babylon. Mm -hmm. It's not the people that will be judged, mm -hmm. but you will be judged if you're still bound to a God, mm -hmm. if you can't let go. Mm -hmm. So that's your judgment. You, you're basically already judged mm -hmm. if you can't let go. Your salvation is to let go and come out of it and follow the shepherd mm -hmm. um, to safety. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to look at all these little things, but in a spiritual sense, what does it mean for us? Everything we idolize or indirectly become your God will eventually become your judgment. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because our Father is gracious. Mm -hmm. He wants to destroy the thing that keep you bound up, that cause you to sin. He will blow it up. Sometimes you get hurt, hit by the debris, but at least you're set free. Mm -hmm. So we all bear the scars of consequences of Things that happen, you know, life happens. And we all have these little war scars. But sometimes it's our undoing mm -hmm. through the things that enslaved us mm -hmm. that he released us from, that had some effects on us. So the wise thing to do is to inspect yourself, do introspection and see which things do I still do mm -hmm. that is an idol in my life. Mm -hmm. Because I might invoke some pain through judgment uh, through the grace of the father upon myself now the seventh plague hail and fire water and fire hail is, is water it's mm -hmm. a different state are two things that cannot exist together the one will destroy the other mm -hmm. if you put a flame on the water or ice it will evaporate and it will disappear we can take water and you can put out a fire but from Yahweh's point of view, these two things are combined. And that tells us that we are now again in the Garden of Eden state where the two kingdoms are meeting. And that's where the theme of I appeared comes in because he's sort of intruding into our realm through 
the concept of these signs and wonders. And his, his appearing brings the fire into our medium of water because most of the things that mm. pertains to life, we need water to survive plants, animals, we humans, and we are water as well. So in that context, him appearing, mm. he's a consuming fire, us standing before him in the flesh form mm. is where water meets fire. Mm. It's the same thing. Mm. But the reality of it is mm. those two things can destroy one another. And that's why the idea of holiness came in mm. to shield us from that and to be elevated to a state <coughs> of a higher body so we can exist in his presence without being destroyed. Comes into play there as well. The what? Family. Yeah, the flesh. It's darkness cannot exist in light the same principle exists mm. um now if you look through history we have the theme of water and fire mm. right from creation the spirit move over the water the spirit is the shin of shamahim mahim is water mm. same principle shin mem mm. um later on moses um which name means to come out of the water moshe he's got shin mem in his name mm. as well and um, he appeared before the burning bush. He as a human is water standing before mm. the burning bush is fire. Mm. There's yet again the water mm. fire experience. Then Israel traveled through the wilderness and they were guided by the pillar of fire mm. and the pillar of cloud, which is water. Mm. Yet again, you see those two coming together. Mm. Um, they built the altar and Aaron's sons brought strange fire mm. before God and he destroyed them, the judgment of the water and fire. Um, from the wrong side of Yahweh's commandments. Mm. Then even in the construction of the tabernacle, when you walk in, you see the brazen altar, fire, the laver, water. When you go mm. into the holy place, you see the menorah, fire, you see the showbread, mm. which is the cleansing water or the nourishing water, the bread. The outside water is the cleansing water. But both basically is the Memshin combination there. Mm. Um, next, Yahweh appeared to prophet Elijah, mm. where he uh, demonstrated that Yahweh is the only true God and he poured water over the altar and fire came down and consumed it. So Yahweh appeared again. Um, next one, Feast of Sukkot, um, Tongues of Fire. The, after Yeshua came, mm. came down and men, we yet again see the burning bush or water, the fire coming upon water. Mm. Then the first trumpet, Revelation 8, hail and fire mixed with blood fell from heaven. Even in the seventh plague, we've got hail and fire coming down from heaven. And then after the thousand years, um, judgment will come upon the people in Jerusalem who want to destroy it. And Yahweh will come down with fire and destroy them. And the people represent mm -hmm. the men of water. So we see the same theme right from creation mm -hmm. to the last mm -hmm. bit where the smoke clears and then the kingdom starts. Um, everything has to do with this theme. All right, so when Moses and uh, Pharaoh was in dialogue, there were four little things that stood out where Pharaoh wanted to introduce four compromises to soften the thing a little bit so he can still have a, a, a hold on the people of Israel. So he suggested four compromises. Mm -hmm. And each time it was a link to a... Um, judgment mm. so the first one is found in exodus 8 verse 24 where he said go sacrifice to your god here in the land mm. so those are the believers in messiah still in the world they worship him in the world they look like the world nobody cares but they actually don't leave mm. and what we can see from this example is that pharaoh still have them locked in the boundaries mm. they cannot go out mm. they can't move far and they're still surrounded by people who can influence them to do things mm. the Egyptian way, mm. which is mixing mm. and um, confusion. It's also a picture of um, you know, people uh, are in a church <coughs> that's fairly dead um, and they, they have a revelation themselves or whatever, and they think that they should stay there to try and change it. And, um, you know, like the Catholic. Yeah. They think, well, if they stay, they might be able to change. But it, it never works that way. Yeah, when they try to share it with the leader, they normally get shut down. Mm -hmm. And they just fell back and lose steam mm -hmm. and don't even bother anymore. Mm -hmm. And then they slowly die spiritually mm -hmm. if they don't get out of it. You know, Philip, we've basically got the same situation now. 
because they will, God is saying to the people, let my people go. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. That's true. We don't want you around. We're going to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. The plagues, because they are holding on, God is going to put judgment on the three nations that have done this for these leaders that are holding, like the Pharaohs, holding the people in, mm -hmm. hedging the people in. Let the people go, otherwise you're going to suffer um, mm -hmm. a plague, and the plagues are coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So the concept of serving two masters come into play, yeah. You can serve your God, but you still need to be in here. But what we don't forget is that Pharaoh was the deity that was worshipping Egypt. Egypt. So they still have to worship him in order to live there. Mm -hmm. So they have to serve the two masters. And um, in Matthew 6, 24, uh, Yeshua talked about that same thing. And then also we get the idea of not serving God and Mammon, which is also two masters. And if you reflect on that within the current modern day, super liberal churches, they've got the money carrot hanging there, mm -hmm. which is one of the masters, but you can also serve God. But he's going to give you all of that. So we've got the same concept of being confined within bondage, so to speak. And their prosperity doctrine is their little wall that holds them in there. Next one is Exodus 8.28 that says, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to Yahweh or Elohim in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. So this one is to stay close, not to leave far. Um, and what that tells us on a spiritual level is, if you want to go and follow Yahweh with everything you got, you'll move as far away from Egypt as you can. If you stay close, mm -hmm. it means that uh, just relax a bit, just turn it down a bit, don't be too fanatical. You know, mm -hmm. don't offend the people around here. Just stay close because we actually need you, and they will tell you all sorts of lies. Mm -hmm. But they actually compromise your relationship in exchange for the compromise to stay there, and then to dumb down your faith mm -hmm. to a level. That's palatable, palatable for those people. So you don't want to offend them. I think Lot is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. They tolerated him in Sodom. Mm -hmm. Would they have tolerated Abram? Mm -hmm. If he would have gone in there, what would he, he said? Mm -hmm. He would have offended a lot of people mm -hmm. telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So Lot probably sugarcoated a lot of things and softened it and compromised mm -hmm. to order to be accepted, to still be close to them. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the tactics of, of Pharaoh. So we should not do that. The truth is the truth. We shouldn't sugarcoat it. But with that, I'm saying we also need to be mindful when there's new people coming in. You sort of need to tone it down a bit. Change your language to meet them so they can know where you're at. Sometimes it might sound like you're compromising. But as they join you on the journey, they'll actually see what you're all about. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit of a, a very sensitive thing. Being all things to all men. Mm -hmm. That's Paul. Yeah. yeah. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. To use wisdom yes. mm -hmm. in order dealing with people. Mm -hmm. and it's not about me, I know the truth, mm -hmm. and then a mm -hmm. truckload of bricks upon him. There's all the things mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. You just squash them. Mm -hmm. well, that's letting down your net rather than using hooks yeah. or a, and little steps, it. baby steps. Mm -hmm. Just meet them where they're at. All right, next one is uh, dividing family. Exodus 10, 11 says, No, have only the men and um, the men go out to worship Yahweh, since that's what you have been asking for. So basically, he's compromising and saying, Leave the children and the women here with me. You guys can go and offer because he knows that they will come back for them. So he's got a hook to pull them back. And not only that, it's um, also about the principle of neglecting family life versus spiritual life. Mm. I heard many stories of pastors whose children mm. basically went astray mm. because they were so fanatical. Yeah. And in a sense, yeah. I was guilty of that as well, yeah. <laughs> part of my life, uh, which I regret now. Mm -hmm. But mm. I played to the tactic of the Babylonian Egyptian pharaoh. Um, which is a religious lie mm. to to be zealous and fanatical and you forget about your own family, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. The fourth one. 
Exodus 10, 24, he said, go worship. Even your women and your children may be with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? You can go and sacrifice, but they sacrifice animals. Mm -hmm. What do you sacrifice? Oh, let's sing a song. Mm -hmm. you know, or jump up and down. There's no sustenance. There's no substance to your worship. Mm -hmm. um, and the spinoff of that is some people will worship Yahweh until the point it starts to cost them something because they don't want to give anything. They don't want to give more time. They don't want to give anything to support whatever needs to happen. And it's all about them at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and that's the principle of coming empty-handed, standing before Yahweh and say, I worship you. And he's looking at you. Oh, really? What? I must be confused. You, you've got nothing to offer. And that's also the thing about um, counting. The previous Torah portion we did last year. He didn't count the heads. He counted the contributions. Mm. The little bit that you can give, whether it's your time or your input or support or helping other people understand, whatever you feel in your heart to do according to his gifts that he allowed you mm. to have, share that because that's your contribution and that's your offering, your sacrifice that you give within that um, fellowship or congregation. Mm. All right, now we get into the more juicy part. Also, you know, when you look at what the Torah commanded for the sacrifices, it was, if you look at uh, Leviticus, it tells you exactly what you, Yahweh required of a person for a sin offering, a free offering, and it, it was something. Yeah. It was an animal. Even poor people could bring a dove. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it was that offering, not empty handed, I can. Thank you, Lord. No, no, no. Get mm. yeah, a mm. But we're even worse off. We worship Him, singing songs to Him, and then we expect something from Him. No. Mm. Yeah, but we so worship we him give Him God nothing, and we want something. something. Yeah. That's the worst kind of worship you can get. Yeah. Mm. We make a deal. Give yeah. me ten dollars, mm. Lord. I want a hundred. Yeah. yeah. And you can keep your ten. Yeah. You, look, you feel nice to yourself. <laughs> now it's a bit arrogant, isn't it? If yeah. you think of it that way. But you can see the tactics of Pharaoh, which is the tactics of the one who infiltrated the system, which is the system of Babylon. That's alive and well today all around us. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So next thing is uh, we're going to just quickly look at the 10 plagues. And I mentioned that they're all connected to Egyptian gods. I'm just going to quickly go through that. First plague, water into blood. That's the god Kunum. That's the guardian of the river, Hapi. That's the spirit of the Nile and Osiris, whose blood was the Nile. Um, second plague was frogs. Um, that's through the um, importance of Hapi in Heket. Um, and they were symbolized by frogs, specifically in the fertility um, attributes. Uh, third plague is lice. And that's the god Sep. That's the god of the earth. And if you read the plague of lice, it's connected to Hitting the dust mm. of the earth. Mm. Flies is revealed through uh, Utticht, Uticht, or whatever. The god of flies. Wakit. Yeah, watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Next one is the fifth plague disease on cattle. That's Ta, uh, Mephes, Hator. Amon, all the gods associated with bulls and cows. Sixth plate was boils. That's uh, Shekmet, the goddess of epidemics, and Imhotep, which is the god of healing. Seventh plate was hail mixed with fire. That's the god of Nut, the sky goddess, Isis, and Seth, the Egyptian uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural deities. And Shu, the god of the atmosphere, weather, and the sky. Eighth plague is locust. That's Serapia, the deity who was to protect the e Egyptians from locusts. The ninth plague is darkness, and that relates to all the deities associated with the sun, which is Re or Ra, Amon Re, Aten, Atum, Horus, oh, sorry, yeah, Horus, all those related to light or the sun or the sun god 
The tenth plague is the death of the firstborn, and this is linked to Pharaoh himself because he was a god, but it's also the identity that Pharaoh had with the snake on his forehead, which is the god Apophis, the god of chaos, represented by the great serpent. So, very interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So all those plagues were targeted at the gods to destroy the gods so that the Egyptians can be released from those gods. Makes perfect sense. So it's not like God is angry and is vicious and he hates people. No, he wanted to destroy their little pet gods that they created yeah, for themselves. Their bondage. Their bondage. Yeah. So that was very revealing. You can see the, the one here with the serpent. Um, I don't know if you can see if it's big enough. And we're going to look a bit more on uh, on Apophis a bit later on, which is an interesting God. Isn't it amazing that this asteroid is coming there called Apophis? Now, save that one for a while. We're going to get to that one soon. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I said another name. Yeah. Apophis. Yeah. You're well connected. <laughs> All right, this slide is just um, connecting the plagues in Egypt to the plagues in Revelation. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Uh, they don't necessarily follow the order, but you can see the same symbolism that's there. What it reveals to us is that the gods of Egypt are still alive and well within Babylon. Mm -hmm. And the Babylonian system is also upon the Egyptian system that's still embedded within the modern society that we have today. Mm -hmm. Even though they don't worship them by name, they worship them by intent or what they mean or what they represent mm -hmm. um, through elevating themselves mm -hmm. as well. Well, it, this seems, it seems to be uh, that more and more it's becoming overt out in the open. So you have the Church of Satan now having a, a public more open yeah. ceremony you have the the um, uh, the, gate, the the Baal, the gates of Baal being erected yes. in, in various in places around the world. Yeah. Mm. You've got the Godab tunnel then yeah. with Baphomet and all of the ceremony yeah. there. Mm. Mm. Um, it's all becoming very so they yeah, actually well, reveal their true nature. Mm. Yeah. 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 They, and their gods that they represent yes. also. Yeah. Mm. And it's done through the Movers and the shakers, the, yeah, the right. people with the money who Global control elite. everything. The Luciferian elite. Yeah. So that's very relevant and evident that that's um, happening. All right. Next one is the seventh plague. Now we're going to look at a few things that's different to the second seventh plague than any other plague. Uh, Exodus 9, verse 13, and then jump through a few verses there up to verse 19. He said, uh, then Yahweh said to Moses, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says Yahweh Elohim of the heavens, let my people go. Oh, sorry, of the Hebrews. Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send my plagues to your very heart and on all your servants and on all your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Behold, tomorrow is about time. I will cause a very heavy hail to rail, rain down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As you yourself exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go, Behold, tomorrow, about the time, I will cause a very heavy rain. I think I already read this, didn't I? Yes. Okay, verse 19 then. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, they shall die. Okay. So what we see here is a few interesting things. First and foremost, the uh, plague consists of hail and fire. We get the mem and the shin, which make the word shem, which connects to the verse that says that I will make my name known um, across all the earth, which is verse 16. Um, the other one is in verse 19, um, where he actually warned the Egyptians that I was coming and they have to hide their livestock and their people. And that show that Yahweh extend grace mm -hmm. to them in the midst mm -hmm. of judgment. 
So even though he seems like this vicious god who just want to smite people, he actually want to save the people and want to smite their gods. Mm -hmm. And that's evident to see. It's uh, also giving them an opportunity to believe in the God, in, in the God of um, the Israelites. Or to obey to, the God yeah, of the Israelites. They have to um, have, you know, believe what he says and, and obey. Yeah. They've got the opportunity to obey the first mm -hmm. commandment extended mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And that commandment will give them access to the Garden of Eden. If you think about it, when he created Adam and Eve, they had the privilege to obey the first commandment ever given to any man, mm. which is don't eat from that fruit. Mm. But they broke that commandment. The consequence was they had to be removed. Mm. Now he extends a commandment to them to obey. So now we can see the power of commandments mm. and how he actually extends grace. Mm. It's not to burden you. Mm. It's not to restrict you in any way. Al anyway, mm. you're, you're currently yeah. under a burden. You're currently restricted. Mm. His grace wants to release you through them. That's why he says it's the Torah of liberty, the law of liberty mm -hmm. that extends grace to you to take you out of your bondage, which are the gods that you serve. Mm -hmm. And that's the context of when you need to understand when you read the New Testament as well when Paul quotes all those things. Because mm -hmm. Paul studied this Torah portion at least mm -hmm. 17 years mm -hmm. by the age of 30. Mm -hmm. And I think he was older than that when he wrote the book of Romans, Ephesians and Corinthians. And he understood this Torah portion very well and the context that we discover here. You know, Philip, when you really consider this whole thing, that everybody was given the opportunity to take your animals inside. I believe there was Egyptians that did it too. Yes. Because they believed in the God. They saw with the rest of the plagues, they saw there was a God. That's why you got that mixed multitude That's that it. went out. A lot of Egyptians left with them yeah. because they obeyed the commandments yes. that was yeah. given to them. It wasn't hard to do. It's not hard to hide your animal. But to go into the house. Yeah. It's actually common sense, isn't it? Yeah. So his commandments is a lot of common sense behind them. Yeah. <laughs> so we say stupid things about his commandments and we don't understand the heart of the Father who's actually giving them. The next one is interesting. The name Yahweh Elohim is only used in regarding to the seventh plague. The first time Yahweh Elohim was ever used in scripture was in the creation story when he created Adam and Chava. And that's in the context of a covenant, which is the marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. So now we see the, the announcement of his name that he wants Pharaoh and everybody to know. And he referred to Israel actually as Hebrews. So you basically identify them back to the Abrahamic mm -hmm. covenant where we identify to as well, because mm -hmm. I'm not an Israelite born mm -hmm. from that nation, but I'm definitely a Hebrew as Abraham was a Hebrew mm -hmm. who crossed mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. So that very subtle language mm -hmm. tells a lot uh, that we, we, we don't realize. Now the covenant concept is also found in the first word of the Bible, which is Bereshit. Now I've got it highlighted here. The two middle letters, Aleph Shin, if you take them out, it makes the word Berit, that means covenant, and Aleph Shin means Ish, or fire. So now we yet again see the, the, the theme of fire and the mm. covenant made with water or with man. Mm. Mm. And the same theme was right in the beginning, the concept of covenant. Um, it was just extended towards Adam and Eve and then extended to Abraham and to Israel, through Messiah and now to all the nations. It's the same concept and it's in, 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 it's in the context of creation. And in our case, fallen state, it's recreation or restoration. Mm. And it has to do with this, him appearing in the form of fire coming into our realm of water. Um, so it appears as judgment. I already talked about the burning bush and Moses representing that. But if you look at the name Moshe, Mem Shin, he's got the same too, but it's got a hay associated with it. So if you had a little picture of Moses sitting there in front of the burning bush that actually produced light, which is the letter hay. Mm -hmm. Hay means light. Yeah. And hay also means truth. It can also mean revelation. Mm -hmm. and that's where Moses got the revelation mm -hmm. of salvation mm -hmm. extended towards the nations and that he is the one that is going to execute that or facilitate that salvation. Mm -hmm. 
So that's a picture also of Messiah um, that's been glorified. His face shone as light, his clothes um, was, was very bright. And he is the one who had the revelation of salvation. And he's also the one who performed, facilitated for salvation, just like Moses did. Same picture. Island um, fire um, and the appearing of, of God eventually led to Pharaoh's repentance because only at the seventh plague, Pharaoh admitted we're sinful, our people are wicked. So he basically repented. And I think a lot of his people repented at that time. So up to the point of the seventh plague would have been enough to set the people free. But there was three more. So we're going to discuss why there was three, why, why three more plagues. If you look at Revelation, they only got sets of seven. I think the sets of seven are actually overlaying one another. It's not seven and then stop and then the next seven and then stop and the next seven. I think they mm. intertwined in a certain way mm. and form. Mm -hmm. um, and the number seven years is also very evident. You know, Philip, when I look at this whole thing, when you take Adam and Eve, they were given a commandment. The day of the, you, the day of you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. So death was imminent. If it wasn't for the fact that he took that lamb, shed its blood, that was Yahweh, clothed them, covered their sin for that what they had done they would have been dead because his grace was that extended that he extended it right there and it was a symbol that that shedding of that blood will go right back to the messiahs yeah. we sometimes we don't understand this that yahweh took that lamb clothed him with the skin mm -hmm. but it was a lamb that was shed a lamb gave its blood its mm -hmm. life for their life yeah because god is an all-consuming fire he mm. would have consumed them there straight away. Yeah, because they're in darkness. Grace so. was yeah. there. Yeah. Now, if you, we this actually discussed this briefly last night of mm. was it leather? Was it this mm. or that? Mm. Uh, was the animal what was killed or not? But the way Yahweh writes his scripture or reveals his scripture to us, mm. there's always patterns. Mm. So we have a pattern of Messiah, that's the lamb mm. whose blood was shed. <laughs> We got the pattern of the Passover lamb, the first Passover in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of leaving Egypt. It's a lamb whose blood that was shed. So we can pull that back into the Garden of Eden. So the same pattern would have done the same work for those who needed that. Yeah. We're in the same state of trouble, so to speak. So it didn't reveal what animal was it the animal, but I believe it was a lamb that was sacrificed and the blood. And the covering was was from that yeah. same, following the same pattern. Yeah. yeah. I think something else to, that's worth considering is how God operates out of time. That at that point, the actual yes sacrifice took place. The ultimate event. The ultimate was that one. At the, that one harmonized. Oh, yeah. Everything yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Connected yeah. mm. above time, yes, above time, they happen in the same time. Mm. If you want to think of that, yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a beautiful analogy or connection there. All right, so you always said, I will send my plagues to your very heart. That's an interesting statement. Why did he send the plagues to Pharaoh's heart? And he sent it upon your servants and on your people. Mm. So the people experienced plagues externally. I think he was shielded from the external turmoil. He was probably in the bunker underground, sitting mm -hmm. there, eating a little chicken bone, thigh, whatever, while picking lice, flies, whatever happening, wherever he was isolated from. But he experienced it internally. And the problem was his heart was hardened. When we read it, he said that Yahweh hardened his heart. How does Yahweh harden his heart? That sounds unfair. Mm -hmm. Poor old Pharaoh, he had no say, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But if you think of it logically, how will I harden someone's heart who's sitting across from me? 
What kind of person does that need to be in order whatever I do will harden his heart? If there's some, someone with arrogance, stubbornness, mm -hmm. and rebellion, I present them with truth. Well, it's like Trump. Their heart will be hardened. Yeah. It's like Trump derangement syndrome. Yeah. That it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter what Trump did. Anything he, anything he did hardens the hearts of the people to towards yeah. him. Yeah. So it's, you know. Yeah, it's a sad situation. Mm. So it's not Yahweh that's doing foul play no. and being unfair. He just presented him with truth. And the truth is tomorrow there will be a play. Mm. That's the truth he revealed to yeah. Pharaoh. Mm. Yeah. If you want to believe it or not, if you believe my truth, mm. you should adhere to the warning. But he did not listen out of rebellion. But the other thing too is he's, con he's considered a god himself. Exactly. So that he was his ego. His ego. ego. His ego is massive. Yes. Mm. And I had a thought about this. I, I don't have it in the notes, but it's just something interesting to think about. The heart is made up of flesh and blood. How do you harden a heart physically? If you if you have a heart to harden, how would you do it? Arteries, the blood, isn't it? The arteries. Yeah, how will you harden it? If, if you have a cut at heart on the table, how will you harden that heart? You just leave it out to dry. No, you put it in the freezer. Oh, so oh, freezer. freezer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, put it in the freezer. Yeah. Because we're in the con on a, in the context of water here. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it in the freezer, the next phase is a liquid mm -hmm. that needs to be contained in a bucket. Mm -hmm. And the next phase is if heated up and evaporates, it's a gas. Mm -hmm. How will I destroy a heart that's been evaporated in a room? I will swing a hammer in this room. I will not destroy mm -hmm. the heart. Mm -hmm. If it's blood in a bucket, probably put it through a juicer or something. <laughs> you hit the bucket with the water, it will splash, but there will still be blood left. Mm -hmm. So you won't totally destroy it. But if it's frozen, I will hit it with a hammer, not even hard, it will burst into a thousand pieces. So what that tells me is that Yahweh's spirit is in the realm of the atmosphere. We're in the physical realm, we're in the realm of the liquid. So the hardening of the heart is going to a realm that makes you very vulnerable for destruction from that point of view if you look at the mediums of, of water what we consist of mm. pharaoh will never destroy yahweh because he's everywhere mm -hmm. he might destroy us but not all of us mm -hmm. but people who are stubborn and arrogant with hardened hearts they're at risk of being totally destroyed mm -hmm. because you can't put that back yeah he uh, he, he commands us to have something that's a soft term of humility or a symbol of humility. I remember years ago, I had this experience. I'd, uh, Sarah and I got involved with this guy. We, we um, fostered one of your kids for a while. We, we did everything we could to support and assist him. Single man with four, four kids. And uh, he talked us into this business arrangement with him. And then at the end, just sort of, you know, pulled out and we were left with a mess and I remember walking out walking out in the garden at night and praying and saying God I am never ever going to trust you know I'm never ever going to let that happen again and God just cut straight across it and he said no I want you to continue to be vulnerable like that he said, and he said, the way he put it is, he said, when this person comes before me, he's going to say, well, look, what could I do? You know, I have four kids and, and whatever else. And, and, and he said, but I gave you these people to provide you the support that you, need to. you needed. He mm -hmm. said, you know, and I just realized that um, uh, being, being, being obedient to God doesn't mean that you're protected because God wants you, might want you to be in a situation where you are. Because um, you've been used for the benefit of others. This, mm. yeah. It was not for your benefit, mm. basically, no. but you got burned. God, because we, we serve God. We serve God yeah. by making ourselves vulnerable. vulnerable. And Yeshua was and the said, perfect example of the most vulnerable mm. one. Mm. And he got burned by all of us. He got, yeah. he got killed. What was that TED talk that we watched about? Vulnerability. Yeah. What did she say again? They actually said that's the concept of bravery 
is to be vulnerable because you need to step into a situation knowing that you will fail but you're still gonna do it mm. that's brave mm. you're not brave if you think you're gonna win you're no. brave if you know you're gonna fail 100 mm. mm. know you're gonna fail mm. then you're brave and you're sure i was that brave he knew he was going to die yeah and he still did it yeah. and he was very vulnerable you know philip when you were talking about the heart <clears throat> constant rejection of the pleading of the Lord on your life leads to a hardening or a stony heart. Yes. Because the word says, I will take that stone out of you, that heart of stone, mm -hmm. and I will give you a heart of flesh. Yes. So it is only when you, one gets so stubborn, stiff necked against Yahweh and his word that your heart becomes like a rock. Mm. Talks about the heart, you know, the rock. You feel mm. like nothing, nobody. Yeah. Mm. And that analogy of heart of stone, heart of flesh is actually what it means to become born again. Yeah. A new person. Yeah. And that yeah. only happens through repentance. Yeah, that's right. Acknowledging that you are a sinner. Yielding over you need everything. Him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. A lot of good little gems coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So. When I get to this juicy part. Um, now verse 14 and 18 states that the seventh plague is a combination of all plagues. It says in verse 14, for this time I will send my plagues on your very heart and your servants and on your people that you may know that's no one like me on the earth. And then verse 18, why do I have it twice? Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause this very hail to rain down such as not been in the earth uh, not in egypt since its founding until now so this this plague is basically the climax of every other plague in a sense you can say that this plague was the heading of all plagues or containing all plagues so if we use the term great tribulation it's one term. It's like the seventh plague. But when you read Revelation, there are cycles of sevens of plagues and things happening. Mm. So the detail is under the heading. In the same way, the seventh plague is the heading and the detail of all the other plagues sits within that. Mm. That's why it's the climax. And through all the things that happened, repentance came. First to the people and later on through Pharaoh, we eventually um, let them go. Um, in saying that, we can draw the parallels to um, the end times. So I've got the end time one on top. So the seventh plague is similar to the Great Tribulation heading, um, which is plague one to six, of course, including seven. So plague eight, nine, and ten is after the tribulation. So that links to the thousand years indirectly, which is the wilderness. And I'm going to link it to the field in a moment. And after that, the Canaan experience of the promised land and the new Jerusalem in the future. So the purpose of the thousand years, we can learn from those three plagues that are separated from the first seven, are basically have another function than the first seven. The first seven had to do with repentance. I'm just going to quickly jump here. I've got a slide for that, actually. I hope I do. I did. I hope I didn't. Well, I probably deleted it. Um, here it is. So the problem was, or the plagues were at Pharaoh's heart and upon the servants and on the people. Now, I, I believe that the people repented by maybe plague three, plague four, some of them up to plague seven because that repentance is something that happens on the inside mm. to get that release but the problem was they were still within the count confines of egypt under the stronghold of the king mm. whose heart was hardened so even though you repent within the system you're still entrapped by it mm. so the first seven plagues are to deal with the internal part of you to repent internally 
And the last three breaks was to do with the destruction of the system. And if you read that in context of the Great Tribulation in a thousand years, you might ask, why in a thousand years? Satan is bound, Satan is released, the final judgment, the war happening there. People are released and set free. Who are they? Why are they there? Are they similar to Pharaoh having hardened hearts in some way that they end up there? And that the other repent up to the seventh plague, which is seven trumpets, bowls, and seals. Um, so there's definitely two groups of people who will experience different sets of plagues or more plagues than others mm -hmm. based on stubbornness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the thousand years is about. So that's what I want to highlight here. So I might, have, might as well continue here. It's, Isn't it true that it, the, Israelites, the Israelites' hearts were hardened too? Initially, yeah, they were resistant to Moses. They didn't want to listen to him. They didn't believe in, in what he was saying. So they went through a process of softening their hearts too. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, that, yes, that's right. It, it, the whole thing was necessary for God's grace to be doing its work. Doing yeah. its work. Because you understand our stubbornness, yeah. our nature. Mm -hmm. And it takes seven blows to hit you out of it, yeah. to knock you out. <laughs> Round seven. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. You don't think it's Boom. me. <laughs> but if you're wise, you won't go in the ring and try and fight Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Just repent and be on his side. Don't go in the ring and oppose him. Mm -hmm. Trying to be, you know, whatever you want to be. Now, verse 20 and 21, the language actually revealed this to us. Mm -hmm. Verse 20 says, for he feared the word of Yahweh among the servants. So the phrase, the word of Yahweh is used. And then later on, it says in verse 21, but he did not regard the word of Yahweh. So fearing the word and regarding the word, give us a bit of a hint what it's about. If I fear the word, it's like it's got authority. And if you think back a bit from a larger perspective, the word comes from Yahweh. Yeshua is the word. And if I respect and fear him, I actually fear and respect the person in the context of a king and a judge. Mm -hmm. So fearing the word is in the context of fearing Yeshua and fearing the king and respecting him and bowing down to him, your new master, no longer Pharaoh. Did not regard the word is in the context of commandment. Mm -hmm. I heard the commandment. No, I'm not going to do that. It's not about a person. It's about doing something that the person said. Mm -hmm. Now, which two camps can you identify here that will end up in a thousand years? Mm -hmm. Those who did not fear and respect the person, mm -hmm. our, our Jewish brothers who did not accept Yeshua as the Messiah, mm -hmm. even though throughout the tribulation, mm -hmm. they will end off in there. And those who did not adhere to his word or the commandments, who are they? Our Christian brothers who refuse to do the commandments or the Torah, they will end up there as well. And if you look at the scenery of the thousand year period, they are going to construct a temple. It's a no brainer that they need to be Jews to do that. Nobody else will want to build a temple that looks like the blueprint of, you know, God's temple. Mm -hmm. Only then they will do it. And then there will be people that will be with the people in Jerusalem, which seem to be righteous. It makes sense that maybe those Christians repented and started to work together with their Jewish brothers. And then there's the other camp who are those who still rebel. And when Satan's released, he will use them to go up against Jerusalem to destroy those people. And then Yahweh will come down and destroy them. Mm -hmm. So those two camps will end, end up in a thousand years. They will eventually slowly soften their hearts and come to repentance. But I believe it's them that's going to be outside of the city. Zechariah 14, that will go year after year and go and sacrifice and do the Feast of Sukkot. If they don't do it, there will be a plague coming upon them. Um, and then those who are rebellious, they will be completely separated and removed. And they will probably go through another cycle of some sort, which is not disclosed. Yeah, but too, when you consider that Moses was in the process of all this, don't for one minute think that the Hittites, Moabites, Jebusites, and all those dudes, all the ites that were on the outside looking in on Egypt, were not saying, hey, 
their God is a great God. That's He's a, a mighty God. Yeah, Look no, what's no. happening to these dudes. Yeah. Mm. He said he wanted to reveal his name to all the world. Mm. Yeah. And all the nations surrounded. They put fear in it because when the children of Israel left, they feared. The Bible says they feared. And there's probably people who joined oh, afterwards. Yeah. Well, when, when they got to Jericho, yeah. um, Rahab Rahab. said, We've heard about your God and what yeah. he can do. Yeah. And we're fearful. We're, you know, we've been seeing yeah. you advance towards us, basically. And, yeah. Uh, so it's a magnific magnificent work that he did. Now, in relation to that, there's three passages I want to read just to underline this importance of the two camps and for them to rather choose to soften their hearts and not be stubborn. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the call for the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God or Elohim and the faith of Yeshua. So you see, it's not the commandments of Yeshua and the faith of Yeshua. It's the commandments of Elohim or the commandments of Yahweh. Second one, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went and fight with the remnant of her seed. So that sounds like believers that are not definitely not raptured. The perseverance of the saints. The saints, the people who follow God, they're definitely not raptured. Um and he went to fight to the remnant of a seed, um, those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yeshua, the Messiah. We see the two. So our faith or the mm. complete faith is the two sticks. Mm. You need Judah stick, the Torah. You need Ephraim stick, the Messiah, mm. or the knowledge of the Messiah and um, mm. knowing his work and then put them together. And that's what the recipe is of salvation, if you want to package it in that way, um, for being released from this bondage. Revelation 22, 13, 16 says, I am the Aleph and the Tough, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life to enter through the gates into the city. Now, entering through the gates of the city, we made a joke of it last time. Well, not a Presbyterian gate, the Catholic gate, and the Baptist gate, and the Lutheran gate. It's the 12 tribes of Israel. So Israel will be restored, and they will enter through those gates. And they need to have um, the commandments. And they are in context of the one speaking who is the Messiah, the Aleph Tav. Yet again, the two that will help you or to give you access into the, into the city. Um, which is the place of salvation. All right. Any comments or questions on this, or should we take a small break? Small break. Small break. Yeah. I'm getting like All right. So we're still in the seventh plague. <clears throat> so I just made it bold up top here. I will send all my plagues to your very heart and to your servants. And this is in the context of the seventh plague. And that's why I highlighted the fact that it's a it's a heading and it actually captures all the plagues collectively mm. and if you think about it the theme of the water and the fire is just symbolism for Yahweh appearing mm. through signs and wonders and mm. judgments and this one was the only one that's classified as a plague and the signs and wonders and judgments actually collectively is that term mm. plague mm. just like the great tribulation is mm. tribulation we'll never see before mm. um, we've seen the same language here as well mm -hmm. okay, interesting things about the seven seventh plague um i think i missed something um i did say that okay the first the the um term field is used seven times in the story of the seventh plague. So that means that the field or the word field is, is um, underlying something. So if you've done the previous Torah studies with Jacob and Esau, we know Esau was a man of the field. We know what he did. He's more fleshly orientated. So the field automatically refers to either nations or the flesh. Yeah. internal or external and seven times um, and plagues hitting um, 
in the context of the field is basically to deal with the fleshly things inside of man as well as with the nations that are still uh, in bondage under their own gods and things that they do. So it's about that purification of the flesh and purification of the nations. Um, the seventh, uh, the seven uh, times field was used is in context of the seventh plague. So we see the number seven now underlining and that give us the connection to the book of Revelation and also the Feast of Trumpets where we looked at the cycles of seven. Mm -hmm. And we know if we look at the numbers, six, seven, eight, what does six, seven, eight mean? If you just think of the progression of the numbers, what does that mean? Can anybody mm -hmm. remember? <clears throat> Man. Man, six, yeah. Seven is the cycles, yeah. And what does eight mean? Yeah. So the cycles of seven is required to elevate number six to number eight. It doesn't jump. There's no rapture from six to eight. You have to go through the cycles of seven to get to eight. So it's a process. Number eight means uh, new beginnings. It's also, if you put it on the side, side the infinity mm -hmm. sign, which is due with high olam, mm -hmm. eternal life. And six, of course, is man, mm -hmm. fallen state. So to elevate the fallen state to high alarm state, the cycles of seven, which includes the Sabbath, mm -hmm. the seven feasts, mm -hmm. all the things mm -hmm. associated with mm -hmm. seven are the cycles to elevate you from mm -hmm. a fallen state to a higher state. So if you say the Sabbath is not important, oh, it's a little gear that's not turning in your life. Mm -hmm. There's something in you that's not going to be elevated. I'm not going to say you're going to hell, but you're not no. going to be complete. That I can guarantee you. Mm. Um, so people who do not choose to be engaging the cycles of seven, mm. whatever they are, is going to miss out on being elevated. And it's all about the scale of least and great mm. in the kingdom. Everybody's saved, if you like, or you made it in the gate. But within the kingdom... Where will you sit? Will you sit on his left hand, right hand? Will you mop the floor? Will you clean the toilets? What's your role within the kingdom? Mm -hmm. um, not to say that we want to roll. I will be a brick in the wall in the Holy of Holies mm -hmm. if I can be that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the best position ever. Mm -hmm. um, but Yahweh call that a reward. Mm -hmm. So salvation is getting in the gate, so to speak, but there's a reward. And the reward has to do with an appointment where you have an authority to rule over nations or you do whatever he wants you to do in the kingdom mm -hmm. and you can become part of his um, authority level mm -hmm. or council or whatever you want to call it um, and I think that's an honor mm -hmm. if you just someone you just scrape through I think you're very grateful mm -hmm. but you don't feel it like an honor and we should not be lazy and trying just to skim through like you not study for exam and hope you pass. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't treat our walk like that. Mm -hmm. It's all about what can we do to promote the kingdom, to work with Yahweh in order to get his plan implemented. And you will get a reward based on what you've done, good or bad. All right, so that's the cycles of seven. And then I already said that. I already said that. So I'm not going to go there. Uh, this is to do with what I said about um, the two levels of deliverance, the one that's happening internal with amongst the people and the servants. The other one deals with a heart. Now, every one of us can have a hardened heart, and that's where you get the concept of a stronghold or something that is a structure that holds you in. Even though you've got the concept, I need to repent, but this you can't break through this mold. It's just holding you back. It's normally something externally imposing, imposed upon yourself. For example, if you're part of a congregation or assembly and they've got doctrines and things that you love, they've got a nice band and all that, and you know it's not the truth that they preach, but oh, that, was me. that music is so nice. That's a stronghold. And it's holding you embedded in there and you can't move on because you can't let go of something. So we need to deal with the heart matters. And lay down your heart because the heart is deceitful and it will hold you back if you if you don't get that and you stand the chance of missing out 
being in the first repentive cycle, which is the first seven signs and wonders, and you might end up in the last three if you don't watch yourself, which is not a pleasant experience where the others will go and have a marriage feast and whatnot. You'll be there in the desert walking around, well, where do we find water kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to put ourselves in, in that situation. I know a lot of people don't have that view, but um, if you read everything, including Zechariah 14, there's also alluded to that in Revelation. You need to ask the question, who are the people at the end of the thousand years? Where do they come from? Mm -hmm. I thought everybody was burnt, the rest mm -hmm. were raptured. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, there's still people. So where do they come from? Mm -hmm. um, so there's questions you need to ask if you read all the scripture and take the scripture serious. Mm -hmm. All right, I already mentioned the, the two camps. The Torahs need to embrace Messiah. The Christians need to embrace Torah to get the balance, as we saw with those three scriptures. scriptures. But here is the strongholds that also at play. Um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, he said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for destruction of fortresses or strongholds. Ephesians 6, he said, for this, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, and against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. So we think the government might be evil, but there's actually a stronghold in heavenly places that place that mm -hmm. evilness within the government system, which is basically just the Babylonian mm -hmm. system that I referred to previously. So if you want to take out all government members, mm. they can just be replaced by someone else mm. because you, you haven't dealt with the root mm. cause. Mm. And unfortunately, we can't deal with that. It's Yahweh and they need to deal with that. Mm. So that's why our weapons is only to do what Yahweh asks of us, be obedient and pray. And pray. Mm. That's all we can do. We can't start a riot or yeah. do things and yeah. shoot people mm. and go crazy. Mm. Because the stronghold is not within the human mm -hmm. level. Yeah. It's beyond. And you might get in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have guns anyway. So good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> you get the <laughs> Throwing stones. Yeah, so it's never about taking authority in your own hands. Yeah. It's trusting Yahweh and pray against those things all for Yahweh to reveal those things so we can avoid those things mm -hmm. and give us wisdom how to live in this world because we're all still entrapped within this Babylonian mm. Egyptian mm. world system until they come and destroy it which is the next slide which mm. is the next three plagues we're going to start dabbling into that mm. I did highlight the three plagues in the previous one just to recap the eighth plague is locusts um, mm. Serapia the deity of protection against locusts ninth plague is darkness to do with all the sun gods from Ra to Horus. The tenth plague is to do with Pharaoh himself, the serpent, and Apophis. Now I've got the little YouTube link in there, which I watched. You can watch it if you want. Yes. Um, okay. If you Tom Horn, is it? Tom Horn, yeah. Mm. And basically, he did research and he wrote this book about Apophis. And Apophis is an actual Egyptian god. You can see the picture there, the square on the top right. That's one of their gods. And that's what NASA chose to call the asteroid that's apparently going to hit the Earth in 2029. Mm -hmm. Now, with Elenin and all the other stuff that they promoted on their website, that was a hoax. Then it was a cry wolf situation. Mm -hmm. But I will take the date with a pinch of salt. I don't know if that's going to be the date or not the date. I don't trust NASA as far as I can throw them. 2029? No, 2029 yeah, is during the feast of Passover, I think. Yes. Apparently. Uh, 2025 yes. is basically prior to that leading on to that. Um, and they link this to basically the event of the third trumpet which talk about Wormwood, because Wormwood um, is also called the star, and the star, according to Greek, is Astron. Oh. So there's a connection there. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think about this connection? 
Mm. Yeah, the, the NASA connection with the asteroid that's called the Pophos, that's the Egyptian mm -hmm. god that leads to the 10th plague, mm -hmm. that has to do with destroying the final strongholds mm -hmm. of the system. I've got another picture. Have you ever, ever read uh, the books of Emmanuel Velikovsky? No. He's a very interesting person. He 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 crossed what do you call it fields of study, geology, astronomy, whatever else, uh, theology. Uh, instead of focusing on a particular all the ologies, and um, he he's, he came up with a really interesting proposal in that uh, the biblical um, reign of hail and fire um, and, and some of the events associated with the Exodus coincided with a close pass of Mars to the earth before it ended up in its final um, resting place. Yeah. Now, I don't know, but I thought it was very interesting yeah. and, and, and it had to do with, you know, the connection between uh, what you might call natural events, there's no such thing, and the biblical record. And he, he, he um, not only that, he re, he, he looked at the whole of the Egyptian um, historical record and all the dynasties and corrected it. Mm -hmm. He points out that where, where, the, where it's at fault and how it all lines up once again with the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd read, I read all this stuff prior to mm. ever becoming a Christian. Mm. It, might, it might be worth reading. Yeah, read again. Yes. Yeah. So who is yeah. it's Emmanuel Velikovsky. Okay. Uh, two books I can remember. One's called Worlds and Chaos. And Worlds sorry, Worlds and Collision and Ages and Chaos or something like that. Mm. Um, That's good. You've got that on. Mm. You record it better. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So if people want to find the book please let us know what you read because i'm not going to read sorry <laughs> like i said this is love to I, I read it all yeah. prior to becoming a yeah. believer so yeah i'm just jumping to the slide that's in relation to something else i just found this little picture i sort of pricked my mind to think in a different way now this is a picture that someone made linking the asteroid to apophis and that's actual uh, Egyptian image of the, the snake was in there, the way they interpret it. And if you see that, and you read Daniel 2.34, about a stone that's not cut by hands, that's going to hit a statue, which is a symbolism of this Egyptian little man. Mm -hmm. And the solution is all of the problem is solved or the solution is within the problem. So Apophis, that's the serpent Nahash, was the original problem, is going to be destroyed by something of a similar name. Just like Mashiach and Nahash links through Gematria. It was just interesting to see that the serpent and the stone share the same name. And the one is the problem, the other one is the solution to the problem. Linking to Daniel, it's just a thought that I um, made when I saw the picture. Not to say that it's going to be like that. <coughs> so my take on it is, there's a fact that wormwood is coming. It's happening on the third trumpet. It's going to make all the waters bitter, and a third of the people will die of drink of. You can read that on a Hebraic level. Water is the word. It's corruption. People who read it will spiritually die. Uh, if they adhere to the doctrines of what is going to be shared. It can also be a star, can also be an angel um, that will fall. If you read further in Revelation, it talks about the angel will come down and when it strikes the earth, it will open up the abyss. Mm -hmm. And then the supernatural disasters will start, which the scorpions and the locusts mm -hmm. and all those things, alien-like beings will come and torture the earth, which is prophesied in the book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many years after Noah, where the fallen ones will be released. Mm -hmm where they're bound underneath the mountains mm -hmm. and they will come and become judgment upon man. Mm 
So that links up with Revelation. It also links up with a star that will fall. And this star is also called Abaddon mm -hmm. or Apollyon, which is the commander mm -hmm. over those locusts and things that will be, mm -hmm. uh, do the structure. And interestingly, the plague of locusts in Egypt in this context is also linked to the locusts in Revelation, mm -hmm. which will be those creatures who will come and torture men. So there's a lot of links, and the, the one that will fall will also be the commander. So that tells me it's definitely the Nahash, mm. which linked with the serpent. Mm. So there's a lot of things that link together. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't help us if we speculate. Mm. Mm. If it will happen, it will happen. But we're not looking at the third trumpet. We need to get our timing route right when the tribulation starts, mm. because that's when we need to succumb. Mm -hmm. this is when the eye yeah. happens. Yeah, I appear sign. where we see the signs mm -hmm. of the sacrifices and abomination and all that. Mm -hmm. Then we go. Yeah. That's yeah. our event we're looking for. And it's not connected to a date. I don't like mm -hmm. date setting, connecting no. to NASA's dates and all yeah. that. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. But it's pointless knowing when it will be because we will see something prior to that mm -hmm. that's more real to us. Mm -hmm. Um, we know we were talking about the rebuilding of the temple, yeah. but um, Monte Judah says it doesn't need to be a rebuilding no. of the temple, just an altar. Just the altar, yes. because you built from inside out. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because, in fact, in fact, the, isn't it the sacrifice of the red heifer is the beginning of the process? Yeah. Of, Quite interesting you mentioned that. There's a double ganger that looks just like me. In Israel, he's a rabbi, and he constructed the portable tabernacle or alt uh, altar. altar. Mm. I actually got a picture of him. He looks oh. just like me. Um, so this is like Did God's, the real guy in the face. I don't know. <laughs> another one? It was just funny <laughs> when I saw that. And that he's connected to the altar. That's the portable altar. Yes. That they can put on a truck and put on Temple Mount mm. and do sacrifices. Mm. And they had that ready, I think, in 2011 or... Mm. 10 or somewhere somewhere back then yeah yeah very interesting it's very significant and uh, that they have a portable the, altar is very significant the other thing that came earlier was the uh, shellfish coming back into that part of the mediterranean mm. that provided them with the blue for the but the priests and the priestly and the Levites, Levites has been trained up in the priesthood. That, um, that mm. whatever you call mm. it is, um, it is kind of see through. Mm. Oh, Only when it gets in contact with the light, it turns, it turns blue. blue. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Blue activates it, and then but it's not also the light activates it. Yeah, I think but so. if, it, if it's a different condition, it purple yes yeah it's yeah. a bluish purple color it's not yeah, a pure yes. blue color yeah mm. very interesting that. yeah, yeah. a lot of interesting kind of thoughts that's just mm. Mm. <laughs> flying around it's but it yeah. gives me a bit of an idea that we're closer than we think it's that's that's what i yeah. 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 But if i think we know what's happening in the vultures and the eagles that start flying towards you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't know. i need yeah. to go now <laughs> <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> Let's run. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now we're switching gears towards the Passover theme. So Exodus 12 is about painting. Um, it says, verse 6, take care of them until the 14th day of um, the month, even when all members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. That's the um, sacrifices. And they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over fire, along with bitter herbs with bread made without yeast. And do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. So we see again the shin mem connection so put a lamb on the barbie <laughs> open fire 
So what we're going to look at is the symbol of the painting mm -hmm. of the doorpost linked to the threshold covenant, that link right to the Passover, that links into the future, also to the marriage covenant, mm -hmm. which got two stages, which is very interesting. So the letters, if you paint the sides, which is called the mezuzot, and the top, you can make three letters in Hebrew. You make a chet, that means life. You make a taf, that means cross or death or yoke. And you make the letter hey, that means light, revelation or truth. And we all know what those letters mean in previous um, studies. The one note I want to make is that chet is also the number eight. And it means new beginnings. Um, and that's the doorway. All these letters indicates a doorway. Now, if you're on the inside of the door in that relation to that context, it was a door you enter into for protection so that death can pass you over. So this, the blood was not for you. The blood was for the death angel to see that they are covenant people mm. in here. Mm. I will pass them over. The lamb was for the people inside, mm. not for the death angel. Mm. So the lamb is for us to eat, to give us sustenance. Why do you think they need to eat everything? And they get a for a long time. You're going to walk, you need some strength, you need to eat some good protein so you can um, sustain the, <coughs> the journey. And lamb, and lamb is the best meat for, yeah. for protein. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a picture of not picking and choosing too. You have to eat the whole lot. Yeah. 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 Lucky I love everything in the land. Yeah. That's your own smoke. I eat everything. Yeah, and even <laughs> when we decided to go plant based, at that stage we had a Passover coming up. And the command said, You eat lamb, so I ate lamb. Because mm. you can't modify it with beetroot no. or whatever you want it is. <laughs> you need to do the commandment in the right way and just put your little preference aside mm. for that moment and whatever reason you do what you do. Mm. We need to do what Yahweh wants to do because mm. he's got a good reason. We did. Um, we, we had past hours before where we had vegetarians and vegans that mm. actually had beetroot <laughs> instead oh. of lamb. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not the commandment. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it doesn't have the same meaning. Meaning. Yeah. 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 <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> 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 the of God who take it away the sin. <laughs> be, be, no, beetroot juice. <laughs> beetroot juice. <laughs> yes. And the body, the bread. You don't eat bread. You then you eat the whole beetroot. And you like the, the juice of the beetroot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no offense to our vegan and vegetarian yeah. brothers. This is my stuff. beetroot juice given for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Chet is number eight. That means life and new beginnings. Taf is number 400. What does number 400 mean? Work of the Messiah. It connects to 40 and 4 as well. 4 is also number the door, Dalit. Mm. This is the actual doorway, mm. so it still connects. Mm. Moses went up for 40 days, mm. he went up twice, first mm. coming, second coming, work of Messiah. So 4, 40, and 400 is always about the work of Messiah. And 400, um, 401, which is Esau and his 400 men, is Aleph Taf, which is the Messiah in the midst of trouble. Mm. Mm. Hey is number five. Five means grace. Hey is also the spirit of the truth <coughs> that reveals light to us, or yeah, the spirit of truth. Side posts um, is the Hebrew word mezuzah. That means gate, uh, gate post, door post, and post comes from the word zez. That means wild beast, fullness, and abundance. So that in itself gives us an idea if you have. The symbolism of a mezuzah, it, it links to Deuteronomy 6. That's the Shema, Yero Israel. Yahweh, your Elohim, is one. Love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when you sit down at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. 
tie them as symbols to your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on your door frames, your mezuzot, off your houses and on your gates. And that's why the Jews do that literally, because the commandment actually said bind it to your doorposts. They also have the little block mm. yeah. and the tefillin. Mm -hmm. So should we be using those? No. There are people that talk, you know, that mm. are for it. Um, I think it's not bad to do it, but I'll put them in. We've got a misuse on that book. Yeah, so it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. it's about the interpretation of the commandment. Is it mm -hmm. symbolic? If I can paint something on my, my right hand with a marker, which is my personal interpretation of this, and then everybody else can do the same if they want to, mm -hmm. and the same way the Jews decided to tie that, mm -hmm. you can do the same if you want to. It's more about the symbolism of actions, mm -hmm. things that you do. Yeah. You Between the frontlets mm -hmm. is where your decision-making mm -hmm. area sit. Mm -hmm. All your decisions need to be in line with his commandments. Yes. It's not about having a box in your forehead and now everything and your, will happen supernaturally. And your actions. And your actions. Yeah. So it's more about the intent. The, the purpose of a physical mezuzah on your door is a symbol that reminds you because a mezuzah is mounted at an angle. And if you read the story about this the bond servant, which stood on the at the door at the mezuzah and it was through a nail through his ear mm. which is very awkward mm. commandment his ear was nailed to the mezuzah or the doorpost so that little mezuzah at an angle represents you standing against the doorpost mm. your ear nailed to that means that your ear is nailed to deuteronomy 6 verse 4 to 9 and whatever's in inside your mezuzah and that you adhere to that because you listen shema listen and obey so it's just a symbolism for yourself. Isn't it? Um, it's a mini blood covenant as well, isn't it? Yeah, with your blood of your ear against the yeah. doorpost. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and that it's links also, to also um, for you to remember to do the commandments of Yahweh in your house as well as when you go out. So for both. Walk and in and out mm -hmm. from one to space to the other. Tonight. It's a reminder. And, and it's a good emblem in the that's how it's come to your house and now. And if you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is that? Yeah. yeah. So it was an opening point to talk to them. Yeah. Yeah, it's also a symbol. If someone asks you, you can tell them. So mm. it's a connection point for a conversation, mm. which is the TT is a similar thing. If people ask me what's that, you have the right to say what it is. Mm. So it's good to have symbols. Yeah. If you don't have it in your door, it's okay. Yeah. It's just a symbol to say that this household adhere to the commandments and they listen and obey what Yahweh well, says. Well, I don't think it's okay. It is a commandment if you put it up. No, it's not mm. shoot. It's personal. Mm. So what? Can you now you can do it in a different way. You can take a marker and write Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 mm. on your oh, doorpost yeah. if no, you want. That's what I'm saying. Whatever as as symbol. It is a commandment to write, write it. it. Yes. But not in, the the form in that of, format. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the same as the tzitzit. Yeah. Yeah, Christians like to take oil and anoint the doorpost, mm. which is their symbolism of, of that same thing. Mm. As long as the oil reminds them of Yeshua and the word and his protection, then it's in line with this. Mm. But if you think it's yeah. going to chase away ghosts and demons and stuff, mm. Mm, maybe. Well, it does that too. That's yeah, why it's, that's got the shin, yeah, shin means teeth. But oh, that's just some We can use it in conjunction in, in conjunction with a smoking ceremony as well. <laughs> yes, but only if you dance around the fire <laughs> anti clockwise. <laughs> uh, so traditional symbolic manifestation of mm. interpreting the commandment your way, you cannot impose on someone else. Yeah. You need to extract from this. What you want to do with this commandment and do it the way that you feel comfortable with, that means something to you because this commandment is for you. Yeah. It's not to impress someone else. It's yeah. not to start an arguing yeah. point with someone else. Yeah. It's like wearing the colors or the clothes that you wear. You can't tell people to wear the same yeah. and they can't argue with you that you shouldn't wear them. Yeah. It's personal. Yeah. Uh, as long as you have a relationship with Yahweh and understand why you do it. And don't, don't just do it because the Jews do it. Mm. That's wrong as well. Mm. You must do it because you find you meaning. In it. Mm. And you want to do it because it's meaningful to you in relation mm. to that commandment. 
Okay, the top post is a long word. Mas hoc cough. Uh, probably pronounce it wrong, but anyway. Um, mush cough. Sorry, mush cough. Sorry, mush cough. Mush cough. I think that's better. Um, it means upper, lintel, and top post. Comes from the root word shakaf. That means to look, to look forth, to look down, and to appear. So now we see the link to the Torah portion by appear. Um, it's first used in scripture in Genesis 18, 16, where the three messages visited Abraham and they rose up and they looked towards mm. Sodom. Mm. So now we see Yahweh appeared, the connection to the appearing within this context. This word and this root word connects to judgment, mm. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in the context of the plague. So yet again, another layer harmonizing confirming the same thing just from another angle in, in relation to the doorpost but now you might ask why did Yahweh do this you know why do you have to paste it why don't only paint the sides why the top mm -hmm. now you know why Yahweh wants to paint the top because there's symbolism in there mm -hmm. to confirm to have a, another witness to point you back to Sodom and Gomorrah have that context when you think about the blood the covering it's protecting me during judgment um, it's just closing that whole thing. So there's always one little thing that's got an explosion of information behind it where there's a lot of wisdom in there. So Yahweh is not only giving us bread crumbs to give us a whole bakery. Mm. You just need to pick mm. which loaf you can absorb and what you can contain. That's how much truth is associated with one little thing. So the other thing is, if you just think about it logically, it's a door opening. If you have a, a building, and you have two side posts, and you just have stones roughly plastered in. There's a, a situation where those stones can fall down. To give the opening strength, you need to have a top post mm -hmm. to keep the door opening open. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of this top lentil is very significant. Um, there's another Torah portion, I couldn't find it. There's another word that also translates to, to top post of a door. And it's the word that also means male ram or sheep, male sheep. And now you can think the blood of the male sheep, which is the male lamb, is Yeshua. And that's another word that points from another Torah portion to exactly the same thing. But it's a different word to this one. But they share the same meaning. And this door opening is for you to escape judgment, so to speak. And that's exactly what they did. Death angel was coming and went inside the door that was covered by the blood and behind the blood or the blood cover them. And that's why the Christians pray, we need to plead the blood. Mm. We need to be covered by the blood. Mm. So it's not like sprinkle, sprinkle covering. Mm. It's like door post painted neon inside. It's about the covering of a household, not an individual necessarily. Mm. Um, so that's the context of that. Now there's a bit of a rabbit trail that reveal a bit more. If you look at the meanings of shakaf, it says, look, look forth, look down and appear. It's everything to do with looking through the organ called the eye. Is, is there an eye organ? Yeah. Okay, it's your body technology of the eye. <laughs> so where is the eye significant? If you think about the eye in relation to go as far back to the beginning as you can. She looked she at, the, saw the, at the fruit. The yeah. And then she sinned. Mm. So the eye is connected to breaking the first commandment. Mm. And the first commandment had judgment. In the same context, this word also is the context of judgment. Mm -hmm. Now you see that harmonizing and confirming mm -hmm. the same. But not only that, the looking upon the fruit and then take the fruit and mm -hmm. eat it, now move the sin from the eye to the mouth. Mm -hmm. Because the actual sin was committed by eating, not by looking. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Sermon on the Mount comes from. The sin is do not eat. But I say to you, do not even look upon the fruit mm -hmm. to eat it. Mm -hmm. You see the thing there? Mm -hmm. The actual breaking of the commandment is in the eating but your problem is the eye, and then Yeshua said, if the eye causes you to stumble, plug it out. Mm. 
then you won't even find the tree, let alone eat from it. <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of wisdom that Yeshua reveals to us not to eat from that tree. So now we see there's two things defiled through the first sin. And the top post is connected to the mouth and the eye. So if you plead the blood to the top doorpost on a personal spiritual level, it's covering my eyes and my mouth <coughs> in doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I sin through my eye, through covetousness, mm -hmm. envy, mm -hmm. lust, mm -hmm. want, desire. Mm -hmm. What's the sin through the mouth? What sins can you do through the mouth? Yes. Speaking, yes. cursing. Yes. And what was the first sin that was committed? Yes. Breaking the unkosher law. Mm -hmm. The first law was a kosher law. Yeah. what he declared as food is the term for kosher according to the Jews so the first commandment that was given was a dietary requirement and people break that one there's a prophecy that says that people hide behind the tree and they eat the swine flesh and all those things and they will get the same judgment as the wicked people who do the same thing but they hide behind the tree what tree is it? The tree of life. But they eat things from the wrong tree. Well, they stand behind the tree of life. That's the picture there. They justify it too. Yeah. So is it important for Yahweh or does it matter what we eat or not eat? Because it was the first commandment, I think that's the most important commandment. Um, because eating, like our friend Bill Gates want to do, he wants to modify all food mm. Mm. to change us. Mm. In the same way, mm. that fruit changed Adam and Eve mm. to a lower form. Mm. So is the Nachash doing the same? Does he want to give us fruit mm. that we need to eat from that will make us a lower being? Form of, of doing the same pattern, following yeah. the same pattern. Yeah. yeah. And I believe it's the Nahash sitting behind his ear, um, that, that advising yeah. to do that, yeah. to modify yeah. humans. And I've seen yeah. about two weeks ago on email from that lady talking about what's happening in the, oh, yeah, the, the financial. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. She also talks about the genetically modified mm. food yeah. and how it changes us so yeah. they will eat what they want. Yes. Well, it makes you sick mm. and yeah. they will reduce population by it not yeah. make them live longer. Yes, mm -hmm. they will live or longer because they eat different things. Yeah. They eat mm -hmm. things from aborted babies and stuff mm -hmm. to get that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so covering yourself with the blood in this context is to mm -hmm. take care what you look at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Internet, <laughs> news, mm -hmm. propaganda, doctrines. Mm. Everything that comes through your eyes, what you read and things mm. you watch, take care and be careful of that. And then what you eat is important mm. because we need to be healthy mm. as well. And then what you say is the other side mm. of the mouth is coming from the heart. Um, mm. And not repeat the stupidity and uh, mm. doctrines of men. Mm. All right, the threshold covenant. Now, there's a bit of history on this threshold covenant. It's actually an ancient custom in Syria in e and Egypt. They had the custom where the uh, newcomer, when they arrive, they slaughter an animal and shed the blood on the threshold of the front door of the house. And when the newcomer enters and step over the threshold, they are automatically adopted into the uh, family. So there's a picture of what that threshold looked like. So it's got a little hollow part where they actually slaughter the animal yeah. and then it's got a little groove the what do you call it mm. so. away or through, yeah. mm. what do you call that little groovy thing the groove yeah okay groove yeah. <laughs> so when they slaughter the animal the blood will automatically run across and fill that and if you step over it then you adopt it when you step upon it whatever god they serve will then bring a curse upon you if you mm. trample upon the mm. doorpost. Mm. Then we read about something, I think that Paul said, that we 
trample Yeshua's blood underfoot. Yeah. It's in relation to the threshold covenant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what they, they step upon they, the doorpost they, step in, they stepping they over it. Slaughter the lamb outside the house in the field. They slaughtered the lamb in the doorway. In the doorway. Mm -hmm. In the threshold. Mm -hmm. And that's and where then, the blood came for the yes, Yeah, and they took these of and then they painted the from stuff. that little hollow. Oh, isn't that mm -hmm. interesting? Right. Now if you have this picture in your mind, was that doorway fully covered by blood? In all mm -hmm. yes. Angles, yes, floor. top, sides, and yeah. bottom. Mm -hmm. yes. So you actually step through the blood. Mm -hmm. It's like the stargate into symbolism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You step into it, mm -hmm. into that dimension of protection. Mm -hmm. And then whatever happens here is not going to come close to you, and then you can step back out again. Mm -hmm. But you should not trample upon the doorpost because that's activating your curse, mm -hmm. because that shows disrespect to the, the significance of the, the cultural use. Um, so that was also the custom um, that I believe the ancient Israelites understood, mm -hmm. and Yahweh used that as well. Maybe he he inspired that in the first place. You might not know that. Um, in West Africa, it's also a welcoming sign to sprinkle blood upon the threshold uh, when the strangers arrive um, and when they step across it into the house. So. Uh, uh, but the thing I want to underline here, it's a sign of adoption, which is also evident for us. Because Paul said we can cry, Abba, Father, and now, now we are adopted. And it's basically through the blood of Messiah and receiving of the Spirit that we can say that we're adopted. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, if we step over the threshold um, where the blood of Messiah is accepting him entering into his household, mm -hmm. we are adopted in that house. And in there we will receive um, the spirit, which is symbolized by the tongues of fire, came down afterwards in, uh, on Shavuot. The Jews, they put mezuzahs on and they kiss it. Um, it's also a sign of great hospitality if you do that. Um, so it needs to be treated with respect whenever you enter one of their homes. Um, well, so that's just the history of it. Looking at the three letters, it actually makes a word. That's chata. That means to heap up and snatch away. It's first found in Scripture in Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink, and he shall heap up coals on his head. It's quoted by Paul in Romans 12. Always wondered what that means. It doesn't mean blushing. <laughs> if you do something good to someone who does bad to you, and now they feel bad about it, and they blush, or is there something behind that? But it basically says indirectly, I think, what Paul is trying to explain. If you do good, it's called a mitzvot. A mitzvot is always a positive commandment. It's not a commandment towards Yahweh, it's a commandment towards your neighbor to do good mm -hmm. to them. And like we said last time, the fruit of the spirit contains seed. A mitzvot is the function of or the action of handing the fruit to your neighbor who's a non believer. When they eat from your good work or your mitzvot, they consume the seed as well, mm. and that seed will grow. Mm. So that's the way we transfer Yahweh's word throughout words, but actions to unbelievers mm. through mitzvot. Mm. And that's the context of this. Now, if you think of that in a relation to the doorway, doing good through mitzvot will allow people from the nations to eventually find the door and enter into the mm. threshold covenant mm. through your mitzvot that you've done to them mm. and the seed they consume through your your actions mm -hmm. so you need to have that in your back of your mind if you do good to others it's not to elevate yourself or to mm -hmm. feel good it's about transferring the seed of the word through an action towards an unbeliever very powerful okay the threshold covenant in context of snatching away that's another buzzword that caught my eye because people call that the rapture the twinkling mm -hmm. of the eye event mm -hmm. where you will be snatched away or gathered now, you need to understand the Hebrew marriage covenant. The marriage covenant consists of two parts. The first part is called the ketubah. And that's where they were an exchange of, um, what do you call it, the rights and responsibilities of the groom and the bride, or what we call the vows. Mm -hmm. Now, when Israel met with Yahweh at Mount Sinai, that was the ketubah, the first part of the marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. 
where they exchanged what vows to the Ten Commandments. First, Israel said, we will do and obey everything you say before we said anything. So that's the vow for the bride to the groom. And then the groom said, okay, there's what you need to do in exchange for that in, in context of the Ten Commandments. And keeping those, keep the marriage covenant intact. Mm. If you abolish those, you're going to end up being divorced. Mm. This, the storyline tells us further on, after they received the Ten Commandments, verbally, Moses went up to get the wings blown. They came down. <laughs> they broke the commandments. Mm. They harlot after an idol that looked like Egypt, a nice, handsome Egyptian god they worshipped and engaged with outside of marriage. Mm. Yahweh was furious. He just got married with them, just turned his back, and they did the wrong thing. Mm. And that's why a lot of them died because of that. You're wrong. We mixed the gold, we threw it in the fire, and out came a cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mixing. <laughs> yeah. So the second part of this marriage contract. So the first part is the Ten Commandments, the Mount Sinai experience. In future, we also link it to Shavuot, the tongues of fire, the Spirit of God, giving us the fourth level of restoration, as we discussed last night. The second part of the marriage will happen at the second coming of Messiah, which has to do with the snatching away of the gathering, which is to do with the special covenant. Mm. So I'm going to go to the next picture first, and then I'll come back to this um, concept of sin. So the threshold covenant in context of the bigger picture. So I've got the whole map there. You see the Mount of Olives. You see the Kidron Valley. You see the temple. Now what happened was when they slaughtered the animals, the blood and the water, when they washed the temple area, flowed down mm -hmm. and ran through the Kidron Valley. Mm -hmm. And it ran in between the Mount of Olives and the temple. Mm -hmm. When Yeshua will come and gather his bride, mm -hmm. the Mount of Olives is mentioned. He will yeah. gather his bride and figuratively carry her over the doorpost, just like we carry a bride into a house. Mm -hmm. He will step over the threshold covenant or threshold confirming the threshold covenant and step into the house of his father with his new bride. And then we're part of his household. And that basically concludes and finalizes the marriage covenant between us and him. So the rapture is a very cheap way of describing what's going to happen. It's all about the threshold covenant and the last second part of the marriage of him figuratively stepping over the threshold where the blood of the sacrifices ran mm -hmm. inside the doorpost and uh, the, uh, the doorway. Mm -hmm. All right. So just want to finish this previous one. Now, that word, those three letters, Chet, Tafay, that makes the sign of the doorway. That's Chata. It's got a homophone. That's the word Chatas. That's sin. Now we see a connection between the doorpost, the blood, and the word sin. So the one is the solution for the problem, which is the other one. So what's the solution to sin? Stepping in through the doorpost, getting into a covenant, a marriage covenant, be protected by the blood, being in covenant in the household of Yahweh. Now, if you look at Chatat, it's got Chet Taf and then, oh, sorry, Chet Tet and Aleph Taf. We know who the Aleph Taf is, that's Messiah. We know what Chet is, it's life, new beginnings. It's actually the doorway which you enter through. So what does Tet mean? Tet is a symbol for the serpent, the Nahash. And where this word Chatat is first found is in Genesis 4 verse 7, where Yahweh told Cain after he sinned that sin is at your door. Wow. Very interesting mm. word choice yeah. there. Yeah. If you look at the picture of the word Chatat, there's the door. There's a serpent that's at the door, but next to the serpent is the counter for the solution to the serpent, which is Mashiach. Mm -hmm. Now we see the Nachash Mashiach connection and the doorway. So what does Kay need to do? He need to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Am I going to listen to the serpent? Or am I going to listen to the Aleph Taf? Mm -hmm. To the Nachash or to Mashiach? Mm -hmm. If I pick the Nachash, I will stay on this side and death will get me. Mm -hmm. If I choose Aleph Taf, 
the blood on his doorpost, mm -hmm. I will step in and be covered and I will get Chayulam. Mm -hmm. So that was salvation offered to Cain in the same picture of Passover, mm -hmm. in the same picture of the marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. You see exactly the same thing harmonizing through scripture. Mm -hmm. And even salvation was offered to the man who committed the first murder. Mm -hmm. yes. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then I made the connection here, which you already talked about um, the serpent, the tet, the symbolism of the serpents, the staff that changed to a serpent, mm. and the reason why. It's to symbolize the Nahash within this whole context. And Moshe represented the Aleph Taf. And they used the serpent that will destroy the serpent. Now, if you have a pophis, serpent being destroyed with another name called the pophis that's the stone not cut out by hands mm -hmm. you see the connection there mm -hmm. and it links to daniel 2 verse 34 as well if this is true mm -hmm. very interesting connection there mm -hmm. all right um is there anything else left yeah uh, not really we covered the marriage covenant. Any comments you want to make on the marriage covenant or the threshold covenant? Mm -hmm. What is the sign of the covenant? All covenants are sealed and cut with blood, and without blood, there is no covenant. Mm -hmm. That's the pattern that we see right through scripture, even Adam and Eve mm -hmm. following the pattern of the Lamb. There was blood that was shed right through to the covenant made with Abraham. The covenant was cut with Abraham. Blood was shed up to Yeshua's uh, covenant. Um, in context of the marriage covenant, um, the sign of their covenant was seen in the blood on the sheet. Mm. And without the blood on the sheet, after the first night, mm. the marriage was not recognized. Mm. Mm. And the covenant was broken because she was not a virgin. Mm -hmm. So yet again, we see the same. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the importance of the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. We rely on the blood of the covenant. I think we discussed this circumcision last time or the mm -hmm. previous time about the man that had the sign in his flesh and the woman being one with him, mm -hmm. step into the covenant under his covering. In the same way, Mashiach has got the sign in his flesh. Mm -hmm. We, the bride, come in with him within the covenant. That's why Paul was giving those Jewish believers a hard time and preach that you need to convert through ritual conversion or circumcision in order to be saved to get into the access to the covenant and actually annulling the work of Messiah. Mm. It's all about the blood and the sign. And Yeshua had both. So it's not the one or the other. The one is a picture of the other, but the one is greater than the other. Just like you have a physical small lamb versus the Messiah that's a real lamb. You have a, small, a physical small sign in your body as a male versus the proper sign in the body of Messiah, mm. which is the actual sign. Does it mean that we're not supposed to circumcise if it's wrong? No, you can be circumcised. Paul got Timothy to be circumcised in order to speak to Jewish people. Mm. Otherwise, they would have rejected him. Not for the purpose of salvation for himself, but for the purpose of salvation for others. He did that. So we need to understand how mm. to do it and the motive, which will make it mm. right or wrong, mm. not the act itself. And then Revelation 12, verse 11 says... And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of the testimony. Mm. And they did not love their life until death. And this um, basically underlines the importance of the blood of the lamb, even in the context of revelation, mm. um, which is the final judgment that's coming. Mm. We still need the blood of the lamb. You can't say, I just do the commandments. I don't need the Messiah. I've got friends who rejected Messiah <coughs> and they converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, and they came from a Christian background, mm -hmm. which is bad. Mm -hmm. What is the word of the testimony actually? 
Um, the previous revelation verses had the testimony of Yeshua, who is the Messiah. So that's a message to our Jewish brothers. And the blood of the lamb is the message of salvation. And the testimony is that that lamb is the Messiah. Um, it's for a certain audience. Uh, yeah. All right, that's all, folks. Thank you very much. There's something that I can't find it, but when I when we were reading it this morning, when he, you know, when he starts saying, preparing for the Passover and telling them that this is what they're going to do from now on. Mm -hmm. um, How they'll eat the goat and all that, how they eat the lamb. Because it, it, this will be a day for you to remember and celebrate as a festival from generation to generation, eaten by perpetual regulation. But it says something about on that night. Um, Yahweh being vigilant. Yeah. Um, I think I can find it. Uh, sorry. Anyone else got something? To I just want to throw in communion mm -hmm. as a topic mm -hmm. because we experienced that last week. Any thoughts? Well, I wrestled with the whole thing of of doing it to be polite, like. I'd already come to the place where I, well, for a long time, actually, I've never seen it. And people talk about this incredible experience they have with communion. It's never had that from me. Um, I've just, I felt like it's a, it's like part of the liturgy. Or a ritual kind of. Ritual, yeah. It's still ritualistic. got the yeah. tentacles of the Catholic Church and the, and the, it's got its origin. The sun, you know, the sun god monstrance and the, you know, all of, the, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, arose by other name, any other name. No, mm. it should be the other way. <laughs> you know, it, it's... So, but, so I wrestled with that. Do I do it in order to be... Not to offend the brother? Not to offend the brother. Or do I go by what my heart was wanting me to do and that was and maybe stimulate the question yes or you can speak yes. life yeah yeah so in the end i just didn't do it depends on the situation if if you have a road that you walk with a certain person and they still do that and you know that if you bring this up it might destroy or derail mm. it mm. yeah it's a different situation but mm. if you normally do what the word says it will bring up questions. And I had that experience. When I joined the church in Mahala for the sake of someone just to support them, they did communion every week. And I did not do communion. And people asked me, why didn't you do it? Even a pastor asked me. I had a conversation with him. I said, first of all, you don't support the, or, or you don't have the right symbolism. You use normal bread. You know what bread means? Leaven, sin. So you basically indirectly tell people it's okay to sin because there's blood. So that's a message within the symbolism. And I know that Yahweh takes symbolism very serious. That's why he mm. the, commanded, uh, them commanded them unleavened bread for that purpose. Mm. And the other thing is, then I ask him, so do you celebrate Passover? No. Yeah. That's my problem I have. You mm. replace mm. one with another. Mm. I would have been okay if they did, did, did the mm. Passover mm. and they did communion this in remembrance of mm. Passover, mm. but you at least need to do Passover. I completely leave out the fact that that meal was Passover. Exactly. That. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. That's the problem I have. And that's a fundamental yeah. problem I have is the replacement theology. Yes. Yeah. And then you go into mm. the root where communion comes from. Mm. It boils in the pots of the Catholic church. Yes. Mm. They invented it. Mm. And the church just adopted it and they mm. polished it they up. They wanted to be they wanted to be separate. They wanted to but be also they use it for their own benefit. Yeah. They're not doing They're it for the right purpose. Mm. Mm. They do it because now we can if you if you, you know you can get what you want. Yeah. It's also about taking this covenant 
whatever they want. It's a huge up. thing in the in the Catholic Church, isn't it? But the other thing too is they baptize you into the church. church? Mm. So you're baptized so that's into the sign, church. Yeah. Then every time you take communion, you're spiritually connecting. Reaffirming the, the, yeah. yeah, reaffirming spiritually connecting with the Babylonian another rope system mm. binding you, mm. holding yeah. you down. So I think um, we've all now here's something. Here might be yeah. something controversial because, yes, I agree with the Passover. It, it has meaning. But keep in mind, Yeshua said, this is my body broken for you, right? Each time you break, you could interpret it, each time you break bread, every time you have a meal where bread is, bread is broken, you could symbolically break it as a symbol of us being part of the same body. And, and taking the wine as being symbolic of having the life of Christ yeah. As long as you your know, diet is only unleavened bread, yeah, I'll be it. happy with that one. <laughs> uh, well, no, no. No, we're we talking about talking eating about meal together. Yeah, breaking so bread in, breaking in the New Testament context is just a term for together. eating together. Yeah, but he is, you can yeah. see, is he is the bread of life. Yes. He's the bread of life. The life That's is right. in the blood and he is the bread of life. Our sustenance, our spiritual sustenance, sustenance comes from him. So you could... To me, you could quite legitimately, uh, I'm not saying make a ceremony because that's what they did anyway. Yeah. They went from house breaking bread and they would have had yeah. wine as well. But it's just having a meal. That's yeah. Well, it's, like, it's the same way that yeah. we do when we do our prayer on Shabbat and we break the bread and we pour the cup. It's thanking God for yeah. him, bread. Him, him supplying yeah. us with food and yeah. something to drink. It's nothing to do with Passover. Passover is different with yeah. Yeshua for his yeah. sacrifice. In that context, no problem. No, no, but I'm not yeah. saying, I'm not saying thanking him. It's not, it's not, the only, the only symbolism, yes, in Passover is to remember the sacrifice on the cross. Yeah. And that one is I'm remembering talking, him as the bread of life. I'm talking yeah. about remembering him as, as our life giver. Yes. Yeah, that, that's the showbread. Mm. Mm -hmm. Symbolism, yeah, yeah. which is not matzah. No, no. yeah, no, that's so in that same. context happening yeah. with that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That but it's the same concept that when that he says it's the same concept of yeah. him being that's a life giver, he gives us bread from yeah. the earth. Mm. That's yeah. the same, it's the same yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's, it's therefore every the time we've together. taken the term breaking bread together, it means just get together with other believers, mm. eat together, and when you do, whenever you get together, yeah. talk about the word, talk about the I, word, I talk did. about Yeshua. Yeah. But then the Christians have taken that and made it a, 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 a new commandment. Replacing new, something else. Yeah. Replacing now, I did a study on the sacrifices or yeah. offerings. And there's one called the meal offering. Mm. Now, the meal offering symbolism is exactly what you're talking about. Mm. But it's in the context of the holy place mm. where you're situated when you break that bread. Um, so if you just see it in the right context, you can get the right symbolism. Um, and you actually perform that offering before Yahweh, mm. if you do it in that way, mm. which is different to the Passover. Yes. It's not contradicting the Passover. Yes. It's not mm. replacing the Passover. Yes. It's got an add-on symbolism that's mm. valid mm. within the context of what mm. you do then. Mm. Yeah, so I agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Something I thought of the other day. I don't know whether it was with Monty. And he was saying that unless you are in Jerusalem, you shouldn't be taking part of you shouldn't be taking you shouldn't be partaking of the Passover meal. So where was that Israel? Was they in Jerusalem? They were in Egypt. We're in Egypt. We're not in Jerusalem. Yeah, but Israel yeah, but was in Egypt. Yeah. It's said in this passage, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself. This is what yeah. you're doing, no matter where you are. So, you know, there's so much of people's ideas, conflicting ideas that come into the picture. People say, wow, man, you guys can't even get your facts together. Now, the facts is in the yeah. scripture. Yeah. You just need to read it. Problem is ideas versus scripture. <laughs> just test everything. Get scripture. Yeah. yeah. That actually believe that you are cursed if you mm. do not go to Israel for the Pilgrimage Festival. 
Yes, that's oh. right. What? What now? Yeah. Now. yeah, now. You have this new table. Well, I said, well, well you know, you do when you get there. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have the money to do it so I'm cursed because I don't have money and I'm cursed because I don't go there. Double whammy. So three times a year they fly to Israel. Well, they actually, the people we know, yes, they actually go there. From where? Well, just they, next door. Yeah, they easy. Easy. Uh, easy to preach that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Another thing is, if you're not circumcised, you uh, you don't partake of uh, yeah. what mm. also. So the context of that passage is: mm. it's a covenant meal, mm. and it's not for people who are not covenant people. Now mm. you ask yourself: Are Christians covenant people? They must be they're part of the class. Exactly. Mm. So what we did, we invite every Christian that want mm. to come to Passover. Mm. That's what Paul and we said. got a lot of trouble from our other brothers, brothers in the faith. Mm. They're not circumcised. Mm. Like, so, but they're covenant yeah, people. This is what that Paul was talking about. Yeah. He said, yeah. hey, that means nothing. Like that, 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 yeah. that, that circumcision means nothing. Go and prostrate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cut everything off, let alone the foreskin. The funny thing is, unless, unless a Christian wants to tell that person that they weren't circumcised, they wouldn't know because it's a private matter between them and God. But what I do when I did that, I gave the warnings Paul gave. I said, You do not partake of this meal. If you have an issue with a brother, mm. if there's any unforgiveness. Yeah. Because there's many that are asleep and some even died yes. because it's a covenant meal. The other thing is, if you don't agree with what's happening here, don't speak against it. Rather leave. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things mm -hmm. because you will trample upon mm -hmm. the threshold mm -hmm. doorpost mm -hmm. and you activate the curse upon yourself. Right. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. I found it. It's not exciting. It says, <clears throat> the time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years to the day, all the divisions of Yehovah left the land of Egypt. This was the night when Yehovah kept vigil to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And this same night continues to be a night when Yehovah keeps vigil for all the people of Israel through all the generations. Mm -hmm. So that makes me think how important that night is mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, and it's that, like and, you say, it's a buff we, time. And if we it's applicable forever. That, yes. all time because time. that's the night is going yeah. to be whatever is going to happen on a pass up, I don't know. That's mm. the night he's going to keep vigil over. It's interesting, isn't it? It wasn't just in Egypt. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Will be a full moon. Mm -hmm. Will be a full moon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see the moon. Yeah. In the dark, in the dark, yeah. yeah. It's a pretty trippy experience walking through the bush at night during a full moon, like with no light, just the moon shining through whatever canopy you're walking through. It gets to the point where you can actually see the ground and distinguish. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it looks different than during daylight, daylight, mm. but still, like but balloon. it's still bright. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Clear. Yeah. Scary when you see something in the distance move. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just an animal or something. It's still kind of weird. But not, still, what not is not the what animal? Well, you know it's not a bear, you know it's not a wolf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's 430. All the meanings of number 430. So I see Pharaoh Neho, great house, he is smitten. Child of the sun, Ramesses, um, split loaf, fruitful, to cover, um, to hide, treasure up, shekel, refresh oneself, mind, living being, desire, life, soul, creature, person, passion, richly prepared food. That's the Passover meal. Um, aftermath, spring crop, late crop. So that's a pilgrim glean. fest to glean. Gather. Gather. God is my. Aftermath. 
my God has judged. Mm. It's after the judgments. Mm. Yeah, so. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so there's little sort of information yeah. coming yeah. together, yeah. just yeah. confirming. Can you do the number 137? No, that's even 137. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading something that was, um, I can't remember who it was, it was two people um, joined by Levi, but I can't remember what it was. I just remember seeing it, I was like, oh, that's two times that I've seen the number 137 as a lifespan. So, mm -hmm. so we've got wheel strong, my hero, push, thrust, going out forth, source, spring, fountain, army, guard, watch, pillar, and day of God. What is it in relation to? Um, to Moses and Aaron, um, their parents, I think, their father, who he lived to be, it was something, someone's lifespan. Um, that's this. Yes, Jethro? Yeah, I think it might have been. It was, um, it was Jacob, was it? Was he the cause of It's 100, he was 120, wasn't he? We've 17 more years than he was. Yeah. So that would have been 137. Total age. Because hmm. he had that strange conversation. That's Joseph. Him. Is it Joseph? Well, Jacob. Ah, sorry, Jacob. Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. Because yeah. then he goes into Pharaoh when he first meets Pharaoh. And all they talk about is how old he is. How old he is. Or you know, what was quite interesting was when you read Leviticus and it goes through all of the, um, the sacrifices and stuff like that, the offerings that you should be offering and the procedures of them, mm. how one has got to select an, an animal without defect, mm. whether it's a, um, a sin offering or a, a violation offering or just a good rule offering. But the procedures that one went with it, and something that I didn't quite realize at one stage, I thought the priest was the one that did the, the slaying of the animal. Not so. You had to lay your hand on the animal. You had to slaughter it. The priest then gathered the blood, and the priest sprinkled the blood on the altar, the horns of the altar, and poured it out um, and splashed it against it. Um, the horns of the altar stretched out in the altar and they poured it out, depending on the size of the animal. Mm. The entrails, like the liver, the heart, and all that, that stuff was no, no, no fat eaten by anybody. The flanks, the fat <coughs> were taken off, the kidneys were taken up. That's an offering to the Lord. Mm. Mm. Burnt offering. Burnt offering, yeah. And I, you know, I'm just set to know, and it's repeated over. Mm -hmm. And over, so and over, and over again. Yeah, it must be very important. Eh? It must be important. Mm. Mm. It, what things change, whether it's a sin offering or a peace offering, meal offering, offering, burn offering. Yeah. offering yeah. It's just, there's slight differences in that, but the procedure mm. is exactly the same. And then yeah. I think, but, but when, when I was reading that, and I mean, I was guilty before I started doing this, um, I don't know about here, but in South Africa, can you remember? Um, we used to call it skull pikes when yes. you took the kidneys and covered it with the fat, yes. and then you would cook it and eat it. It's just yeah. a really good taste. Mm -hmm. And then when I read it, I thought, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you don't mm -hmm. eat that. That's no, no, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and you know why? So yummy. Mm -hmm. Scientifically, if you take it. All the toxins are in the blood, yes. in the blood, yeah. in the kidneys, yeah. in the, I mm. think it's in the lungs, all that stuff, that's where the toxins are. Mm. Yo. Mm. Now, Except for the Passover lamb. <laughs> now, the Passover lamb, what part of the Passover it's lamb? It's a lamb. It doesn't have a lot of toxins yet, I yes. think. Mm. And you eat everything. It's you tasty. eat everything in it. Or wow. burn what you don't, don't you? Yeah, burn you burn what you don't eat, so it's probably... 
Only the I should imagine look, the flesh wouldn't be eating a fat because otherwise the you, you're violating another one commandment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's probably only the meat. But the man won't have fat in it. Yeah. It was the man. Yeah, if you roasted the fat mm. strips out and mm. yeah. yeah, it's strict for it. Yeah. I, I, I also think that they had to gather the lamb and keep it in the house yeah. for how many days? Four, four, four days. days. I think they take it on the oh. first of the month and keep and it. And up to the tenth. Tenth of the month. Tenth. Tenth of the month. So for four days. So you, but then they take it four days up. inside the house. Yeah. 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 It's very interesting. I've got yeah. a question back because it said in this Pasha, this month will be the you know, the head of the months for you. Were they already, they wouldn't have, like, they would have had an Egyptian calendar, wouldn't they, then? So I'm wondering whether it meant well, this day is the beginning of a, a whole new calendar, like a new day, or whether, like, Do you know what I mean? Oh, I think maybe the calendar was revealed at the first Passover. Mm. Right. Were the beginning of the month and then 14 days after that. Mm. So because that's the start of the biblical year. Yeah. yeah. So it wouldn't have corresponded with the first day of a Egyptian month. No. Mm. No, no, no. This day is the beginning of that yeah. day. Of the biblical calendar. Right. Yeah. Mm. But it's, yeah, if you take it now, like we see the sun rise before any of the others. In 17 hours mm. before America. Mm. So it's very difficult to specifically for a day, eh? For mm. us, it's that day. Mm, yes. But for them, it's a day later. They've got to come. Uh, mm. So the problem is with the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> we will be too early and they will be too late. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for people who set dates. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's going to happen on this date. Well, so we get to go first thing because <laughs> that will be the first one. Yeah, yeah and the thing is with. But I mean, even in our state, with her being three hours behind us. Yeah, we have to sleep in tents all the time when we expect the rapture. Because imagining you getting trapped in the ceiling cavity of your house yeah. <laughs> while you sleep and you just drop down, you just miss the rapture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would be a very, very scary day for people that have side blinded this thing. Mm -hmm. And when they see a pile of clothes on the road and they see car driving 80 k's an hour down the road, no driver, mm. and things going crazy, mate, that will really be a thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't picture a, what it will be. Um, controversial statement that I've heard about how it could be happen because the word for cloud is witness. It also means witness. So he will appear in the clouds amongst witnesses. Amongst witnesses, not necessarily no, you know, it's a revelation all at once about who she sure mm. that could be also true. But that's also when you will be translated with a renewed body. Yeah. No worry. Now we can just close in prayer and then we can yeah. um, continue. Harry, do you want to close for us? Father, I thank you that you are the stone that the builders rejected. That we are, we are, we feel, we sense that we're on a sure foundation when we put, put our full trust in you and in your word. And we're no longer buffeted by the things that are going on around us in this world. We, Lord, we don't want to uh, become complacent. We don't want to take things for granted. We want to keep our minds sharp and alert and receptive to the leading of your Holy Spirit 
And uh, we just ask that the things that you've brought to our attention today in your word are Lord, sealed up within us, that they become part of that uh, foundation of real, if there's something new or, or it's reinforced within us. And we ask you for this in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Am I allowed to read something 